Oh, that's unacceptable. Where did you see that? No, no, no. It was, it, it's like it, it's diagonal. The, the maple leaf one's bought and then the Quebec oh, flag underneath. Oh, my God. The yeah. hair is even. Well, don't worry. There's a one inch strip between them. Wow. You haven't yeah. seen that. No, go ahead. Great. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to call to order the Monday, February 14th meeting of the Electoral Area Services Committee. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the unceded and traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, whose elders and peoples have stewarded this land since time immemorial. First item on the agenda is public input for the 2022-2026 financial plan for receipt. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And this is the moment to, at the agenda where we advise of any public input received, and we are getting public input, none that relates to the particular budgets that you have before you today. So there's none, none to report on. And just a reminder to the public and that we appreciate the interest in our budget today. And uh, this is also available online and uh, the board is accepting your input or feedback. And uh, please uh, check out our website, provide us with an email or uh, phone the regional district with your ideas with respect to the financial plan, because it is appreciated and very much a part of the process. All right, thank you for that. Uh, any comments on the on the uh, public input? Hearing and seeing none. All those in favor of receipt? Opposed? And that's carried. All right, we are going to start in on the budgets and we've got the 2022-2026 um, budget. Sorry, item number one, is it the Hornby Island Community Hall or is Kevin going first? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Kevin Duvell, who's online, will just provide a quick summary as to where we're at overall right. with respect to budget presentations and then we'll get into the, the specifics. Okay, I'll just ask for a receipt before we uh, hand it over to Kevin. We receive the uh, Duvelle Dog and Pony Show. Thank you. Second, and I will turn it over to Kevin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Russell. Through the chair to the directors, good morning. Unfortunately, I don't seem to be able to uh, put up my video, so I'll just give a quick verbal presentation and then certainly hand it back to begin the budget presentation. So as, as the electoral area directors know, this is uh, meeting number three for the financial planning process this year related to the electoral area services budgets. Uh, there's a number of budgets uh, that will be presented to you today, and then there will be a subsequent meeting um, on uh, Monday, February 28th, where another series of budgets will be presented, including items like grant and aid and feasibility study services and a number of other uh, budgets as well. And then there would potentially be one final opportunity to bring anything back forward um, in early March prior to the uh, annual budget bylaw being rolled up and then presented to the uh, directors um, uh, at the board level um, before the end of the month. And so I'll just leave my summary there and certainly uh, welcome any questions. Thank you. I don't see any lights on from our directors. So, oh, no, that's good, I think. Um, so all those in favor of receipt then? Opposed, and that's carried unanimously. Thank you, Kevin. So now we'll move on to the Hornby Island Community Hall Function 670 for receipt. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And uh, Doug DeMarzo, General Manager of Community Services, is uh, on the line. He will give a presentation that will provide you the summary of the budgets with respect to community halls. That's items two, three, and four on the agenda. So one presentation covering the three, three matters, all of which are community halls in our rural areas. So Doug DeMarzo. Thanks. Welcome, Doug. Thank you and good morning, directors. Through the chair, I have a quick presentation here to discuss all of our community halls, including Hornby Island, uh, Denman, Puntledge North, and Bays, Bain Sound. Um, it's important to note that the purpose of this is to provide grant funding to help support hall operations and upgrades in all halls still run under their own board and mostly nonprofit status. Uh, Puntledge North was recently created out of the transferring of Black Creek Community Hall service and then Bain Sound down in Area A through the AAP processes last year. And Denman and Hornby Island have been existing for some time. As I wait for Lisa to bring up the presentation, I'll continue just along here. Um, on Hornby Island, 
It works out to about $43 per person to support the community facilities at an assessed value of 600,000. Puntledge North works out to about $14. Uh, Bain Sound about $8 and Denman Island about $57. Obviously, the variances here are on support to each call, which I'll go over later, as well as populations in each one, but that's the general overview. Uh, it seems like Lisa doesn't have your presentation. Are you able to share a screen? Uh, yep. Yeah. Give me a second. Lisa, it might be under, um, it's just one presentation under the Puntledge North package that Joanne would have sent you. It's just called Puntledge North. So it'll take a few minutes for that to be pulled up. So I don't know if you want to go ahead without it or. Oh, no, I'm fine to share my screen. I'm just trying to get my presentation okay. set up in a different format here before I share it. Sure. Sorry, I'll have to do this first. All right. How does that look? Do you see the um, just the large presentation on its own? I think it's 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 good for us to see. I don't know, directors. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thanks. Oh, we see same. the numbers. Yeah. The next slide as well. All right. Um, moving forth, you also see the strategic drivers that all of these are really largely focused together on, and that's that operating the community facilities continues to look at the long-term capital needs and plans for those needs accordingly through various funding sources, including revenue for the community halls. And obviously community partnerships stands out here. This provides direct community center support to the daily health and well-being and gathering of arts and others in many of the community halls. And really hall boards make their own service decisions and the CVRDs this there, especially in the last couple of years over COVID to help support through our collaboration calls and onwards. But at the end of the day, um, we have no real limits on our expectations of, on how the halls are managed through these services that rely on each individual board. Moving forward, all services that did receive BC Restart funding to support some lost revenues and aid in capital projects. Um, financial operations continue along and inclusion of the Hornby Island Arts Centre is also seen here. Fixed costs, especially insurance, are a growing uh, future concern. Uh, we will note that the Hornby Island Hall in 2021 process approved a 22% increase for 20. 22, which further jumped to 72,000 to repay prior year's deficits before returning to a modest increase to operations, largely due to lost revenues and union wages. I think of a note here is um, the inclusion of the Hornby Island Arts Centre, although not completed. There was some discussion in the past on this being included in another budget under planning, but upon further discussion, it was uh, proposed that it best sits within the community facilities budgets and we'll uh, undertake the necessary work to, to move that forward. Um, here's a, the budget recommendations outlining, outlined in your report. Um, you will note that the Black Creek Community Hall stands out perhaps, and the Cornby Hall also stands out as larger contributions. And I guess Denman Rex. So those are some of the larger ones we've supported in the past. With the Black Creek, this is around typical, <clears throat> what we'd support in the 60 to $80,000 range <clears throat> in the past, and is pretty much operations focused. Hornby and Denman both have carryovers for additional capital works. So you're seeing larger support there, and that's largely carryovers from projects they haven't completed in, in the last couple of years for various reasons, but, but largely due to COVID. So and we'll continue. Uh, with those proposed supports in, in this. And then Hornby Island Arts Centre hasn't been identified as it's still not built, but um, if you recall, there was a board motion for support of about $20,000 in the past. 
So our work plan priority is really initiating the renewed agreements, consider funding support for emerging capital issues. We do have a number of pieces in play that community halls are concerned about them being able to meet their future capital funds. And we have also supported in the restart focus. So uh, the original restart funds focused on about 24,000 in touchless items that the EASC supported. An additional 40,000 was allocated in May for outdoor washrooms. And this is taken into consideration with winding down the comfort station, which you'll see later. So there is some work to do by staff still to understand the full contribution to this service at the recommended budget stage. Uh, because you would recall the 402,000, which was presented from the province with a focus on rural areas, about 200 was set aside um, with a subsequent staff, earlier staff reports, sorry. And now it's thinks about how this will all move forward with the amount of monies that have been spent, with the amount that have been allocated, and looking at how this 200,000 is redistributed, perhaps on population. But that'll all come forward uh, for your final consideration at the recommended budget stage once finance has, has an opportunity to move through the uh, cost closures from last year. Um, of note here is also, you know, community funds works also play a role in supporting community initiatives. And this is one of those places to think about if, if there is large increases due to, I'd say mainly capital partnerships with, with each individual hall based on a case by case basis. And uh, for Denman, they're really focused on HVAC upgrades in this upcoming year. They got some work started last year and weren't able to actually do the on the ground work. So continuing that project forward and Hornby remains focused on their accessibility improvements, which they identified in 2019. On that, uh, obviously COVID had some impacts and still has impacts on the hall's revenues and some of the functions that happened over the last couple of years have been moved outdoors. I'll leave it with any questions you may have. Sure, thank you. And uh, Director Grieve has a question. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, through the Chair and the CAO, uh, to Doug. Um, you explained a little bit there about the uh, the, the BC uh, restart funds, $200,000 that we allocated to community halls. So that's uh, something we're going to discuss later. So what we're looking at right now in Area C is $86,799 for Black Creek. 9,000 for Merville, 5,000 for Dove Creek, and 4,500 for the Holby Hall. Um, it is a, a bit confusing to the general public uh, when you see Black Creek standing out there, uh, being that they've uh, just had their AGM and they reported 30K in a surplus in their account, and they just received a $300,000 federal grant. Now, um, obviously, uh, the function was set up originally, I remember, uh, for Black Creek to support their uh, programs up there. I think we started off around 50 grand. But it was a, a very selected, designated catchment area that paid in to the service. So am I to assume now that, that all of Area C, or much of Area B, are paying into... Uh, into the Black Creek service, and they're withdrawing 86,799 out of this, the, the, the broader taxation base? Yeah, so if you recall, when we uh, transferred your correct Black Creek, uh, smaller service area ended up being Puntledge North, which included a portion of area B and the, that north of um, the Puntledge River, basically. We determined those closest to the Comox and Courtney Halls in area B wouldn't be paying into the service because they're more likely to use it. So with Black Creek Community Hall, they really service closer to a rec uh, center for area C. They offer programming, if not most days, all day long. They offer um, daycare services. They offer quite a broader spectrum. They also have a full-time staff person to deliver this programming to the community. So it, it's really to help cover their operations costs. And what we don't look at as closely is their grant funding that's able to support. So when they look at 
proposing perhaps capital improvements to us, we always encourage halls to look at grant funding. And if they're successful in getting that, that still doesn't necessarily reflect their day-to-day -day operating costs. So this was really established to be consistent with past uh, grant and aid applications for the other halls, and then to continue to support Black Creek Hall with their uh, operating costs to provide that I would argue a higher level of service than most other, if not all other community halls provide to their residents in their service areas. Oh, okay, but just to be clear, um, so are the residents in the original catchment area for Black Creek paying less per capita now? I would assume so, but I might direct that question to Kevin. Uh, so through the chair to the directors, uh, specifically Director Greaves. So yes, the service area for this particular service has been broadened. So it is a larger catchment base. And then that entire catchment base would be paying towards the support that's provided to all the community halls listed here, including Black Creek. And Doug is absolutely correct as given this is the inaugural year, we have shifted many of these halls uh, over to these new community hall services. We really used the contributions that they received in the past and the budget submissions they did provide us um, kind of as the template to determine what these initial contributions would be. Obviously, as time goes on and we get a better feel for the needs of each of these community halls, particularly around things like asset management and whatnot, our intent is to come back to the directors with some recommendations around longer term um, contribution agreements. Um, that will then kind of outline where we anticipate contributions to each of these halls go forward over the longer term. Okay, I'm not going to belabor this, but I can tell you right now, this is being not well perceived in my area. And uh, I don't see my way forward to approving it. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, might I ask the director to uh, identify what it is that he might like in terms of more information or, or assessment or options from us so that we can bring that back to an, another EASC meeting to, to consider your concerns? Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, endeavor to gather that information for a future meeting. But as it sits right now, you can see it quite glaringly uh, as being perceived as unfair. Thank you. Director Arbor. Um, thank you. Well, yeah, fairness, the, the ever uh, principle that we strive for. Um, so I guess the big change in, in my area and area A is we're now moving soon with the in inclusion of the uh, new Hornby Allen Arts Center. It means we will now have nine facilities in area A. So two in Royston, one in Union Bay, two in Fannie Bay, two on Denman, and two on Hornby. And uh, I guess this probably speaks to, uh, I guess, the culture down in area A, those halls and, and uh, facilities are really beloved and used as they are elsewhere, but it's a lot of facilities. So um, I guess there's, the, and, and then if you stack that against, Hornby and Denman have a really high level of service, but our new Bain Sounds function, as, as you highlighted in, in the, uh, the financial plan, has um, a, a very low, um, you know, first time contribution. And I think Doug is aware that just in the last few months, um, at least two of the facilities in Union Bay and at the Fannie Bay Hall have run into uh, some significant um, renovation issues and one having a bit of a disaster actually with, uh, with the broken pipe there, which the community has stepped up to, to help out. But um, so when I saw that in the report that the, for the 200,000, we were going to divide it by, um, by population, I guess my first question is, um, well, you can, you can probably store my questions, Doug, there'll be two or three, but uh, one is, I, I guess I, was, I wasn't under the impression that we were going to include Hornby and Denman, but if you go by population, maybe that, that would be the case. So I'd love to know staff's thinking on that. And second, it will obviously spread the dollars um, 
you know, across a number of facilities. And when I see facilities that need tens of thousands of dollars in the short term, potentially, um, it raises the question to, I guess that's a core question, Doug, is to what extent would we be able to assist specifically Fannie Bay Hall and Union Bay Hall this year, understanding that they have some significant short-term needs, but they also both need, in my opinion, to complete an asset management plan so we can better uh, predict what's coming down the pipe for them. Um, I have, you know, I've had discussion with both uh, the associations and they understand they start in a, at a really low level of uh, requisition. But um, in that context of those problems arising, I'm just wondering what, what the thinking is and if we'll be able to assist in a more meaningful way in, in the coming year. And then my, my second one, unless you want to address that, Doug, otherwise I can move on to my last uh, kind of point. You right, can feel you. free to move on. I can address all three at once first. Okay. And then um, I guess the last one is, is the one we've been toying with for the last couple of years, which is... Um, how the new Hornby Island Arts Center will, will live and uh, in, in terms of uh, the universe of Hornby requisitions. Um, and uh, I, I do support uh, what you came up with in the end to rather than put it in the heritage and culture to actually bring it in with, um, with Hornby Hall. And, and as you mentioned, a 22% jump this year. So that 22% from what I read from the report would stem from, in part, from that would capture that new requisition for the Hornby Island Arts Center in about 20,000. And then you see that peeling back, so us maybe saving 10 grand in the future. And would that be through operational efficiencies or small reductions to the existing hall? Or if you can provide me with a bit more understanding, because looking at the budget, I couldn't get at the story of, I mean, I like the story, <laughs> if we have a little jump and then it comes back, but um, I'm just trying to think about the, what's the net impact on the requisition for the next five years um, of having that facility. It'd be great if we can identify savings in the hall to make room for the new one, but uh, I'm not sure where, where you stand with those discussions with, uh, with the higher executive. So that's, uh, that's all my questions. Hopefully you, you still have them in, in your mind. Sure. Yeah, I'll start with the uh, comment around the population piece. Um, essentially, Hornby and Denman were included in that original uh, thought process around the grant of the restart funds. If I recall, the original recommendation by the board was about 80000 for the each of the Two, and then I think it was about 16 for Hornby and 16 for Denman. So we could continue along that recommendation or we could move to more population based. Um, either way, Hornby and Denman, I do feel are a part of the community hall family. So we'd wanna be equal distribution and looking at them still as we move forward. As far as core funding goes, we are soliciting <clears throat> comments from community halls and really this looks to be building the reserve funds and looking to how community halls can establish partnerships, including their own community support and putting proposals forward to the CVRD. And we will have to bring those forward to you guys through either the budget process or maybe in 2022, if we don't have it in place by the recommended budget, perhaps it's amendments to the reserve funding transfers or something down the road. Although Kevin's probably shaking his head for amendments, but they do happen. And that's the reality of starting up in an or inaugural year of the service. And you also have access to other funding as well. And we encourage our community halls to do grant funding. So we really are looking to their boards to put forward a full package showing how they've reached out for contributions from the community and asked and looking to us for partnerships. And this is where it gets tricky, right? It comes down to allocation of funding, but really it also comes down to age of halls, need, um, desired activities uh, to create those capital assets. So it's, it's hard to treat all equal when all are at different stages of life or have different emergency needs, such as a water leak or some mold issues or whatever comes out of the woodwork, for lack of a better word. So core funding is is always gonna challenge this service for equitability. And the directors sh should know that we are trying to establish reserve funds and there is other funding mechanisms out there to look at. 
But at the end of the day, we're looking for the partnership piece, the community halls identifying their needs through, you know, sound estimates and, you know, sometimes fronting those contractors money to provide those sound estimates in order to make the best decisions and recommendations to the ASC. Last on Hornby Island Art Center, it's not part of that budget uh, yeah. yet. So oh, okay. we're, we're continuing, we feel in 2022 um, that it's, it's not necessarily gonna be a $20,000 uh, piece. So that would just be a budget amendment coming forward to add to that from the reserves. Uh, if they do indeed get built in September, then you'd be looking at a prorated budget if it was needed for the operational cost. So we'll continue to work with IAC or the Hornby Island Arts Council to determine what those needs are as we move forward. Um, the plan is looking at, again, the, for Hornby specifically is those major capital items. And we really have to get a better understanding from Hira on, on on what the revenues are gonna look like in the future and if that opportunity is there to reduce that contribution. And that's those questions, you know, with COVID still in play and, and the halls, you know, different operating models under COVID will, will have to come out in the wash. So part of this, you know, is just those, really they're known unknowns for lack of a better word. And we'll just have to deal with that in the 2023 budget process through discussions. Yeah, I have a follow-up. Okay, that's, uh, thanks for uh, the additional notes. It is, um, it, it's difficult. And, and I think everything that you said is right. They're all organizations and facilities that are at different stages of life, so to speak. And, um, but, and I guess over time, over the next five, 10 years, maybe it will even out, but it's tough for me to see a big jump in the Hornby requisition to almost 70 grand a year. And the facility has been closed a lot, right? Um, say more than Fannie Bay will only get five grand a year. And they've been actually open quite a bit. And that has to do with, in some of the halls, Black Creek, Hornby, Denman, we essentially support operations program slash staffing, right? Whereas some of the other halls are still purely on a volunteer basis. And so that creates a kind of unevenness because it's one thing to say to Hornby or Black Creek or Denman, you know, you have more resources, you actually have more capacity to go and chase grants with those resources. The ones that are at low level requisition may not have that capacity. So they might end up just getting stuck down there. You know what I mean? So for those who have more resources, maybe the expectations of service delivery and all those things should be higher. And maybe the ratio of external funding should be higher over time. I'm not talking for this year, but those are, now that we have established those hall services, those are things I think that are noted in the communities. Um, and COVID has amplified that because it revealed all the, the weaknesses and fragility of some of the facilities, whereas others were well-funded through, through it, through that requisition. Um, so in the short term, again, I would really encourage, I'm getting calls for sure. Um, Union Bay and Fannie Bay are still on volunteer basis. They're facing significant uh, short-term needs, I think, in terms of facilities. So whatever we can do to help, and if it, uh, if it means that Hornby and Denman get a little less, um, since they're well-funded, I'm, I'm, I'd be fine with that. Um, so that's that's my feedback. I, I, I realize this is a preliminary budget. You're probably hoping that we would pass all this today, but uh, I'll leave it to my colleagues to see if uh, if we want to bring this back up again. Or and Doug, your feedback too. If if the feedback you're getting from us is sufficient for you to to go back, and if you think there's room for adjustments. Great, thank you. I have a question as well, and then I'll pass it over to Director Grieve. Um, Doug, you know, I know this is the inaugural budget and, um, you know, primarily all of the smaller halls were getting paid through grant and aid. And, and this was our effort to try and bring um, stabilized funding to, um, to each of these halls um, that were having grants on a one-off basis. Um, I'm hearing some of the comments from fellow directors around um, 
yeah, just capacity from the smaller halls to be able to um, increase their their granting opportunities. Is that so? Question is more on um, you know I'm hearing uh, those other halls need support in helping to chase grants, and those other halls um, are probably going to need a, a, a very robust asset management plan. Is that part of your work plan, or you know, uh, for your department? Um, and if not, uh, is there something that we can do in terms of asking for a study around um, capacity for both physical and operational um, capacity within the smaller halls? Yeah, so um, with regards to the asset management uh, piece, you know, we, we do have encouraged our halls to look at that. You got to remember that we're very preliminary with our conversations with them and and everyone's just sort of finding their way at this point. Uh, some halls are further along with their own asset management planning and, and some are, are, are not really along at all. And just, you know, have an understanding somewhere in one of the board's director's minds or something. So yeah, lots, lots there to unpack. Um, the second part of it, as far as our work plan staffing to support grants and grant writing of these halls, we did not foresee that as our role, you know, it's really at this stage, it's, it's only me uh, that really coordinates with these halls. And, um, you know, I, I have lots of other responsibilities beyond uh, the day-to-day -day coordination and collaboration with the halls. Although I do, I fully reach out to support them, but Kevin and I have a lot of other stuff as well. So if you wanted resources to support those, that would be a question you'd have to sure. put forth sure. and, and report back to you on what that may look like. Fair enough. Director Grief. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and through the CAO to, uh, to staff again. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, in no way, shape or form am I belittling the work of the Black Creek Hall. They, Dana does a fantastic job up there. They're very professional. They got an actual accountant doing the books. Whereas we saw quite clearly some of the other halls, uh, their, their budgets on the back of a napkin and uh, everybody looks a lot like me. So um, I understand, but uh, I think that maybe, you know, it's obvious, obvious that staff, you know, they're, they're doing the prudent thing and taking a long game, long game with the, uh, the provincial funds. But I would make the point that as a provincial restart funding, uh, it's not to be saved for some future rainy day. This money has to be get out the door now because we've had the, the halls have had uh, a, a, the COVID has had a big impact on, on the usage. Uh, there's no, dances and whatever. There's a few things still going on, but you know, I think, and uh, you know, without being too crass, being an election year too, I think that the public wants to see something happening, not something happening three years from now. So I think that that money was meant to be an emergency fund. And it is uh, obvious not, not being viewed that way. So I do think that we have to do a little more than almost cover the insurance for these halls. I mean, we're not even doing that, I don't think, with insurance rates well, they are right now. Let alone, uh, you know, the, keep them on life support, which was the original uh, concept, not for, not for capital improvements so much as just operations. You take you know, look at your gas bill, your light bill, your phone bill. Etc. And then you compound the fact that the roof's leaking and uh, and the uh, the walls have mold and whatever. So I do think that we have to spend this money this year on these falls. Thank you. Thanks. I see uh, Kevin's hand up. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Chair Hermir, through to the directors. Um, I just want to assure you that. Uh, in the budget submissions that are in front of you today, that does not, as Doug alluded to, include the uh, restart allocations at this time, um, given that the, the board did formally um, approve the restart allocations just in early January. So those will be reflected uh, in our recommended financial plan. And as Doug alluded to, currently we have those allocated as uh, $80,000 to the Bain Sound Service, $80,000 to Pontledge North, and then $16,750 to each of them and in Hornby. And 
the intent um, is certainly to, to get those dollars, those specific dollars out to those various community halls this year. Uh, the intent is not to sit and wait on those funds, but certainly we would uh, need to be working with each of the community halls to determine um, you know, where best to, to uh, allocate those dollars. Thanks very much for that. Much appreciated to, to know that there is the, those funds and there, that's not a small amount of money either um, going to the different regions. I don't see any um, other lights up. Um, and I note that um, in your presentation, Doug, you did all of the, the financial plans for the, all of the functions, but I think we should probably receive the each individual function uh, first. So if that's okay with the, the rest of the board, I will ask us to receive the Hornby Hall function 670 first. Um, any, the, oh, okay, we'll receive this. Okay, so we'll, okay, we'll vote on receipt of Doug's presentation. Um, any comments on that? Um, anyone, all in, all in favor of the of receipt? And no one's opposed and that's carried unanimously. Okay, and then each of the recommendations we do individually. So um, first is that um, the financial plan for the 2022-2026 Hornby Island Service 670 be approved. And I see Dir Director Grieve, did you have your, no? Okay, so this is 670 moved and I can second. Any comments on this, this function 670, um, Director Arbor? Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a note before it comes back, uh, if, if we can just test, it, it's a huge jump. And if we add Hayek, if you come back with an amendment later in the year, that, that'll be a lot. So if, if there's an opportunity to find savings, in that discussion with Hira, that'd be great. I know we have a lot of going on with Hira right now, but I'll still approve it for now. Okay, thank you. No other hands up. So I'll ask um, on, on the approval, uh, all in favor? Any opposed? One opposed, Director Grief, And that's carried. Thank you. Recommendation two is moved. And I can second that the amendment to the bylaw 1590 being the Hornby Island Community Hall Service Area Conversion and Establishment Bylaw be brought forward to expand the purpose to include the potential for support of other community facilities on Hornby Island, such as the Hornby Island Arts Center, and further that the Director for Electoral Area A, being the service participant, be authorized to consent to the amendment in writing. That's been moved and seconded. Any comments? Okay, seeing none. All in favor? Opposed, Director Grieve, and that's carried. Now, do we need to receive the function, the report? Um, uh, I'd like to ask the directors, are you are you okay with the yeah. receipt of Doug's as the receipt of these written reports yeah. as well? So you just go on to the recommendation. On the recommendation, yeah. great, okay. So the next recommendation is that the financial plan for function 676 Pantledge North Community Facility Support Service be approved. Do we have a motion? So moved. I will second to bring it onto the table. Um, any other comments on the approval of the of the budget for 676? No? Hearing and seeing none. Then all in favor, it's it's a vote of their area B and C. So in favor, I'm in favor. Opposed? Director Grieve? It's a weighted vote, I should say. So it's a weighted vote. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's defeated, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm Director Grieve. You know, really rather than going through this, this, this exercise, why don't we defer this back, refer it back to staff? Okay. For some some little bit of finessing on this on this, I think they heard quite clearly, you know, what our concerns are, and uh, I think I'm thinking it would deserves a, a much more sober second thought than what we're doing right now. Thank you. Okay. I will second that referral. Any comments on on referral? Back to staff. Deferral or referral? Sorry, referral. Yeah, referral. Okay. <clears throat> All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. 
Item number two is the proposal for the financial plan for Bain Sound Community Fat Facility Support Function 672 to be approved. That's been moved. I can second. Comments on that? Hearing and seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? Director Grieve. And that's carried. And uh, item three has been moved that the future expenditure reserve be established for Bain Sound Community Facilities Function 672. I can second. Comments on that? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Director Grieve was said in a favor or opposed? I'm in favor of establishing. Okay, in favor. So that's unanimous. Thank you. And the next recommendation is that the, the proposed 2022-2026 financial plan for the Denman Island Community Facility Service Function 675 be approved. Moved, seconded by me. Comments on that one? All right, all in favor? Opposed? And that's passed, thank you. All right, thanks Doug for that. We're gonna move on then to the Jackson Drive Sewer Service Function 330 for receipt. Moved and seconded over to staff. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Directors and Derry Monteith, uh, the Manager of Liquid Waste Planning is on the line to present this budget and answer any of your questions. Thanks, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Russell. Good morning, everyone. Um, Lisa, I, I can't start my video, but I, I don't think that's gonna be a problem. Well, okay. good from our end, Derry. Thank you. Yeah, and, okay, uh, excellent. Your, presenta your presentation is up on the screen. Perfect, okay. So, um, so yeah, I have for you first here today the budget for the Jackson Drive Sewer Service, Function 330. Uh, next slide, Lisa. Thank you. So the Jackson Drive sewer system was built in the early 1980s by a developer to service a 16 lot subdivision and adjacent to Anderton Road in electoral area B. The system was subsequently handed over to the regional district for operations and management. Uh, the system is made up of a small collection system connected to an extended aeration treatment plant and then discharging to a land-based disposal field, which you can see highlighted in red on the, the photo to the right here. Uh, the service is funded by an annual parcel tax, and the 2022 parcel tax rate for the service is $1,109 per user with a total annual revenue of $17,744. Uh, a parcel tax amendment bylaw was adopted in January 2021 to align with the financial requirements of the service and ensure that adequate reserves are being collected for asset replacement. And an approximate 4% increase in parcel tax revenues is proposed in years 2022 through 2025 for this service, which is consistent with the adopted parcel tax bylaw. Uh, next slide. So there were no major projects undertaken in 2021 for this service, and there are no capital works planned for 2022. However, we will be completing a condition assessment of the disposal field in 2022. A replacement of the disposal field is currently planned for 2023 and is to be funded through a combination of community works funds and reserves. A disposal field replacement is currently budgeted at $125,000 and will need $65,000 in reserves to fund the upgrade. Uh, we still have six, around 60,000 in community works funds remaining uh, available after the upgrades to the treatment plant that were completed in 2015. So next slide. So the proposed financial plan for the service includes uh, $4,917 for personnel costs required to operate the wastewater treatment plant. And these resources are provided from the CBRD's pool of wastewater operators. Operating costs uh, have increased by $4,886 in 2022, and this is to complete the condition assessment of the disposal field to confirm timing of replacement in 2023. And a contribution from reserves also continues to be a key expenditure for the service, as well as contract services and personnel costs. 
And there's also a small transfer to other functions included for the management fees to function 340, the liquid waste management planning service, as well as uh, vehicle use to function 335. And um, with that, I take any questions on the proposed budget. Great, thank you. Um, do any of the other directors have questions? Um, Darian, I'm not sure if I missed it on the report. Do you have an idea of, and maybe this is a Kevin question, how much is actually in reserve? Yeah, so um, Madam Chair, currently there's almost $60,000 in reserves, uh, 57,975, is that right, Kevin? I believe that's correct, yes. Okay, so after this budget's approved, they would have the 65,000 needed for the, the uh, replacement. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? That's correct, but it will, um, yeah, kind of deplete all of the reserve funds yeah. that are currently collected, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if I may share, uh, Humer, um, there is uh, annual contributions to the Capital Works Reserve built into this financial plan. So we do have uh, about 7,600 years slated to go into the reserve in 22, and then another about 65 in 23. So okay. we are continuing to put money away for sure. those eventual needs. Okay, thank you. And just a question on the leftover um, community works funds. If um, if not all of it is is needed for the replacement costs, um, would that go back into sort of general revenues, or is it does it stay in this function only? Uh, through the chair to the directors. So um, yes, it once once this project is complete, um, certainly finance would work with Barry and her team to ascertain if the remaining uh, allocated funds of community works are required. Uh, if they're felt they're not, um, then certainly we would bring um, something back in front of the directors to potentially look at uh, decommitting those dollars and putting those back into the general um, community works fund pool. Okay, thanks. That's all the questions I had. I don't see any other questions. So on receipt, all in favor? Opposed? And that carried. Recommendation has been moved and seconded. Sorry, I'll bring that on my screen. That the proposed 2022-2026 financial plan for Jackson Drive Sewer Service, Function 330, be approved. I don't see any other comments. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. We're gonna try and get the next ones in, the King Coho. Three, three, one. Great, uh, 331 has been moved and seconded and probably back to you, Derry. Yes. yes, thank you through the chair. Um, I think, yeah, there we go. Thanks, Lisa. So the, the King Coho Wastewater Service is uh, one of our newer services. Uh, next slide, Lisa. It was established in early 2018 to provide wastewater treatment to 37 strata units in the King Coho development, which is near the Little River Ferry Terminal. Uh, the CBRD took over ownership of this system in October 2018, with 2019 being the first full year of CBRD operations. The system includes a rotating biological contactor treatment system with a marine outfall. And you can see in the photo in the middle is the RBC drum with the small treatment building which houses controls, piping and a sand filter. And the system also includes a small pump station shown in the photo on the right, which conveys flows from, from one of the strata units across the Little River. Next slide. So wastewater treatment plant upgrades were successfully completed in the fall of 2021 on budget. And this project was paid for through a combination of reserves, community works funds, and short-term borrowing. The project included conversion of the emergency storage tank to an equalization tank to allow for primary solids to settle out in the EQ tank, and therefore reducing solids loading into the RBC unit and improving water quality. Uh, most of the works were underground, so I don't have um, a whole lot to show with photos, but you can see uh, here on the photo to the left, the general excavation area and uh, the completed project highlighted in the photo on the right. Uh, this project has resulted in improved effluent quality and uh, a reduced risk to the CVRD of enforcement actions due to previous permit non-compliance. For this year, there are no additional capital expenditures planned for the service. 
Next slide. So the, the 2022 parcel tax rate for the service is $1,786.41 per user, which is consistent with the 2021 rate and includes an estimated uh, $205 per parcel in short-term debt financing costs to be repaid over the next five years. Uh, the proposed financial plan includes a 3% increase per year in parcel tax rates for years 2023 through 2026. And an amendment to the parcel tax bylaw is uh, recommended and a draft of the bylaw attached to the report. And um, the, the rates in the bylaw align with the financial requirements as outlined in this proposed financial plan. Uh, the proposed financial plan includes $12,239 for personnel costs in 2022 required to operate the wastewater treatment plant and position allocations for this service remain consistent with 2021 with a 10.63% um, position of a wastewater treatment plant operator allocated to the service. Management of the service is again provided by the liquid waste management planning service function 340 and that service is reimbursed $1,000 for management fees. Uh, we do see a moderate increase in oper operational expenditures in 2022, and this is mostly to complete an assessment of the bridge which carries the force main from the, the pump station uh, to the wastewater treatment plant across Little River. And to accommodate this, the 2022 reserve contributions are proposed to de decrease just slightly to accommodate the change. Um, I think I've highlighted this before, but we are playing a bit of a catch up for this service with regards to capital reserves, as there were no reserve funds transferred to us at the time of system acquisition in 2018. Uh, at this time, uh, reserve balances at the end of 2026 are projected to be $118,406 for capital works reserves and around $24,000 for the future expenditure reserve. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions on the proposed budget for the service. Uh, Director Roberts. Yeah, I guess uh, just a small question. Well, first of all, yeah, those numbers are obviously high for the residents, but it's not news. We, we've known that for a while um, since the city already took over the service that there was um, deficiency in the reserve and replacement costs. The only thing that I'm curious about is in the amendment for the bylaw. So in the second recommendation under 1C, um, we see the annual parcel tax move to um, 2010 dollars by 2026 but then why does it say in thereafter uh, is that is that is that binding our hands for then or why do we have the and thereafter there because i you know that's five years out i, I can't predict what the next five-year financial plan would be thanks there yeah. thank you uh through the chair uh, the intention is that the bylaw would be reviewed every five years um and kind of um reviewed in the context of, of the asset management plan and updated if necessary. I think the, the thereafter is, um, is there so that if, if there's not a need for an update to the parcel tax bylaw in year 27 or 28, that that rate can carry forward. I think Trip Driver has a follow-up. Thanks, that clarifies. That, that's partly why I guess we're not doing it this year, but in, in our first budget budgets where I ask if we could have a graph that graphs out things over time that one slide would answer all those questions. So we're basically saying that at that point, you're, you're expecting that we can fall back behind inflation and just keep it steady. Thanks. Thanks for that question. I don't see any other. On receipt then, all in favor? Opposed? And it's carried unanimously. And recommendation one to approve the function 331 budget has been moved and seconded. Any comments? Hearing and seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, recommendation two has been carried regarding the uh, the parcel tax bylaw number 563. Comments? Mm -hmm. Seeing and hearing none. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. And I think we might be able to squeeze in number seven, Courtney Flats Drainage Service Function 791 for receipt. Moved and seconded by me and over back to you, staff. Thank you. And it is Derry for this one as well. Thank you, Derry. Thank you. 
uh, through the chair. I think I've got just a, a very short presentation for this one as well. Uh, so next slide, Lisa. So um, the Courtney Flats drainage service was created to drain fresh water and limit tidal water intrusion into Dyke Slough. The service was established in 1987 to address historic drainage and flood problems in the area. And the existing infrastructure consists of three tidal gates that were installed in 1989 and financed through MFA. And the service um, debt was fully repaid in 2009. The service is completely funded by parcel tax collected from each of the 15 participating properties for operation and maintenance, as well as a contribution to reserves. Uh, the parcel tax rate is $47.90 per hectare with no changes to the current rate included in the 2022 to 2026 financial plan. The service area covers approximately 153 hectares in total for an annual revenue of $7,329. Uh, no direct staff time is allocated under this, this service. Instead, management is provided by the Liquid Waste Management Planning Service, Function 340, which is uh, compensated $1,000 in management fees from the Courtney Flats Drainage Service. Uh, next slide. So the operating budget for 2022 remains consistent with the 2021 budget with just a slight increase in liability insurance. Uh, key expenditures include an allowance for contract services for minor maintenance activities and a contribution to reserves. Uh, the reserve contribution has increased in 2022 due to the availability of a prior year surplus carry forward. A uh, combined capital works and future expenditure reserve balance of $128,747 is currently projected for the service. And replacement of the tidal gates is currently planned for 2024, which will be funded by reserves. Uh, and consultation with residents, producers, uh, agency and environmental stakeholders will be required in advance of these replacements to discuss the best way to manage these tidal gates into the future. And uh, climate change will have a significant impact on the service in the future and will be also a key consideration when we're planning for this uh, renewal of these gates. And uh, with that, I will take any questions. Great, I see a question from Director Grief. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just quickly, this service has been going since uh, 1989. Is that what you said? I'm sorry, I didn't catch That's it. That's right. So in 1989, um, Courtney, or at least the, the parcels that were uh, later taken into Courtney were paying into the service. When did they stop paying into the service? Um, through the chair, I'm not sure if I, I know the answer to that one, but um, certainly something I can look into. Well, just to make the point that they're definitely still benefiting from the service, but you know, since it's now part of the city of Courtney, they're not contributing. Thank you. Thanks, Director Grief. And I'm just going to make a quick question. Um, I, Derry, I think you're aware of um, a potential application that's going in around um, sea level rise um, for the in front of KFN that planning is is putting forward. Do you know if there's any interaction between this function and and that proposed uh, project? Thank this you. is like the Green Shores um, uh, project. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. To answer your question, there's there's no, I guess, um, this service is not a, a part of the, the project and the application, but certainly that work will be looked upon when we're looking to um, plan for the replacement of the gates and kind of the future of the service. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. On receipt then, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And the recommendation uh, 791 has been moved and seconded. Any comments or questions? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And we've made it in to the, the next section. So uh, we only have one minute, a one minute recess. We can do that.
I'm old. Madam. <laughs> I'm All right. Three, three minutes. All right. We will start at uh, 10 3. What time the meeting started? They must have started at nine. Yeah, so maybe. We're already at this one next, the Ministry of Forest Infrastructure, number one. Yeah. On Saratoga. Oh, so, might be. Can you look it up? Move it up? No, we can't That's use there. this one. You have to see on your phone. Oh, what's that? So it's Gil Campbell. Great, thanks. Um, I see all the directors are back. Um, before we proceed, I just want, we do have a full house here in um, in the, the room. And for those of you who are wondering, um, we're at capacity at, at 30 people. So if, if you're wondering why people aren't able to join you in here, it's because of the COVID regulations and our staff are just making sure everyone's um, safe and, and uh, able to be distanced. So we'll move, uh, we'll call the meeting back to order. And Director Grieve, would it be appropriate this time to uh, to uh, uh, vary the agenda? How are the other directors feeling about that? We do have uh, Ministry of Transport on the line as well. Yeah, maybe out of respect of okay. the, uh, the ministry, you might just ask whether they they're okay with a bit of a delay because their schedule has has no. I, well, it's okay. We'll, we'll go with the with the ministry because they're on tight tight time. I, I understand. Thank you. Thanks very much. So we do have a delegation. First, dele we have a couple of delegations today. And the first one is from the Ministry of Transport and Infrastructure. We have Kellen and uh, Chris from the ministry moved and seconded on receipt. And I'm going to turn it over to you for your presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm, my name is Kellen Truant. I'm the uh, operations manager <clears throat> with um, the local uh, Courtney office here for the ministry. Uh, like I said, we do also have uh, Chris Cowley with uh, uh, Main Road, the general manager with us. And we also have um, uh, Michael Pearson, our district manager, and Marissa Beniski, our local road area manager with us today. 
So thanks everyone for the uh, the opportunity to to meet and present our uh, our annual update. And if we're uh, we're good to move forward, I'll just uh, go ahead and share my screen here. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, we can see that. Thanks. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you again. So yeah, as I mentioned, uh, this is a, our annual update for our service area, service area three, which is the North Island area. Uh, so what we'd like to do today is just go through, um, kind of have a, a discussion on our uh, previous year's uh, significant accomplishments, uh, go through uh, you know some information and discussion on some of the, um, the um, um, major events that happened or significant events that have happened for us over the last year. And then, uh, then we'll move on to uh, some discussion on our upcoming year's program. Okay, so to start off with, I would like to go through um, the some of the, the significant accomplishments that we've uh, we've completed through our uh, through our maintenance program. Uh, so these would include uh, some programs such as the so the Solom River Road graded aggregate seal, uh, some other works we've done, crack sealing Comox Valley Parkway and Highway 19. Uh, we've been working on sweeping in coordination with the, so uh, the cycling coalition uh, installation. 53 culverts, improving drainage throughout the regional district. We've added in culvert liners to multiple culverts throughout the area. Uh, this should improve resiliency of this infrastructure for the future. Uh, we've conducted a replacement um, asphalt patching program on Strathcona Parkway and Nordic Drive. And we've also done the redecking of the, the timber bridge on Farnham Road. Uh, so these are just a few of the, um, the select uh, projects and, and uh, maintenance works we've we've completed that we'd, we'd like to share and um, this next slide here just a, a highlight of the the current conditions out on Solomon River Road so the graded aggregate seal um, is, a, is an application uh, this is done between uh, Fitzgerald Road and Headquarters Road it seals the road surface against moisture and increases the lifespan of the of the pavement all right, moving on to our, uh, I guess, in our previous year's accomplishments through, uh, through our district programs. So we've had a number of, uh, of projects completed that we'd like to highlight. Uh, the first being Back Road Trail Phase 2. This is the sec section between McDonald Road to South Luke Crescent. We've also uh, installed a pedestrian signal and crosswalk on Ryan Road at Cowichan Avenue. Uh, we've completed some lighting improvements at Comox Valley Parkway and Highway 19 at the interchange. We've also completed some preliminary engineering and design for shoulder widening on Knight Road and installed a few uh, new highway webcams at uh, Highway 19A at the 17th Street Bridge. Okay, so just to go through in a little bit more detail. So this is um, our back road trail phase two segment. So this was construction of a 400 meter wide or 400 meter long, sorry, widened shoulder and separated pathway this is along Back Road and 100 meters of uh, separated pathway along McDonald Road. Uh, so this included uh, construction of a lock block retaining wall with steel railing. Uh, we paved in the previously constructed gravel pathway between Satlut and Strathcona Crescents. I've done some resurfacing as well along Back Road, along with drainage improvement and some local revegetation. All right, now moving on to Ryan Road at Cowichan Avenue. So the scope of this project includes uh, installation of a pedestrian signal at Ryan Road and Cowichan Avenue, along with dedicated push buttons adjacent to Cowichan Ave uh, for signal activation, as well as replacement of the existing concrete islands, uh, along with wheelchair accessible ramps and construction of uh, concrete curb and sidewalk. All right, uh, so this is the Comox Valley at Highway 19 interchange lighting improvements. So here we've designed and installed uh, improved LED lighting at the interchange, uh, including Cumberland Road and Minto Road. And uh, this also includes installation of uh, LED lighting along the underside of the overpass. So if you're through there uh, in the area at night, you'll, you'll probably notice some, some improvements there. Uh, finally, uh, Knight Road, this is our shoulder widening. So over the past year, we've been doing some, uh, some engineering design uh, for future shoulder widening. We look to accommodate uh, 1.5 meter shoulders on both sides of the road 
Uh, so our, our preliminary work this year included survey, environmental and archeological impact assessment, and we'll also be completing culvert replacement and base repair work in advance. Okay, now I'd just like to speak to our, uh, our previous year's resurfacing program. Uh, so a couple of uh, significant projects worth mentioning there. Um, you may have noticed out on uh, Highway 19A, if you're heading north to town, uh, we now have uh, resurfaced the section between Howard Road to Oyster River. Uh, we've also completed resurfacing out on Lake Trail Road between Log Comox Logging Road and Bevan Road. So that's just a couple of current uh, photos there to show the, the resurfacing done. Okay, uh, and then just wanted to mention as well, uh, a couple of the, uh, you know, like I mentioned, significant events that we've uh, seen occur over the, the, the previous year. So first was, uh, was winter maintenance. I'm sure everyone recalls we had a uh, fairly significant amount of snowfall come down uh, over the months of December and January. So just wanted to speak a bit to uh, some of the, the maintenance um, uh, details and challenges that we've, that we've experienced. So uh, worth mentioning, we've seen, uh, like I mentioned, significant snowfall, um, not seen uh, for quite a number of years uh, since some previous highs back in 1996 and 1970 uh, for, uh, I, uh, for a short period of uh, uh, time, I guess, for a uh, short duration. Uh, so we also dealt with some challenging temperature fluctuations. Um, so during this time, the December and, and January snow events, uh, our maintenance contractor Main Road has put out 500 metric tons of crystal salt, 4,100 metric tons of winter sand, and 1,315,000 liters of brine within the regional district. Um, we've also had uh, 19 plow units, which were deployed around the clock during these periods, uh, except for some, some um, exceptions for mechanical downtime, as you can imagine. Uh, 45 operators working 12 hour shifts and five subcontractors utilized for support. Uh, Chris, I'm not sure if you had any other points that you wanted to, to mention. Uh, no, Kellen, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a bit of cold here. So you're speaking more eloquently than me, um, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about the, uh, the winter maintenance. Just, it, was, it was definitely a, a challenging time for us, but uh, we threw everything we had at it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And uh, judging by current weather, we're, I think we're all fingers crossed that this is the, the last we see of it for the season. But um, yeah, so I, I think by the, by the numbers, we certainly got enough to fill a, a standard season around this area. Okay, now I just also wanted to touch on the, um, uh, some of the, the significant uh, um, uh, rainfall and flooding events. Uh, I'm sure everyone's now familiar with the term atmospheric river. Uh, this was uh, particularly back in, uh, in November and December of last year. Uh, we saw a considerable amount of uh, rainfall again come down in, in relatively short periods of time, which, uh, as I'm sure everyone is aware, has caused uh, quite, a, quite an impact, uh, not only uh, provincially, I'm sure you know, everyone's seen what's happening out in the, particularly the Lower Mainland and, and Fraser Valley, but also here on the Vancouver Island. Uh, luckily for us up in the in the Comox Valley Regional District, uh, we've been relatively spared from uh, well done well in compared to in comparison to some of the other areas on the island. Uh, but just wanted to bring up some some statistics here just for for interest sake. Um, so again, this is uh, this is as a result of the the atmospheric river events which occurred uh, late last year. Uh, so we've been tracking. Um, impacted sites for a total of 107 separate sites for the Vancouver Island District as a whole, uh, zero sites within the CVRD where Ministry of Infrastructure was affected. We had two major sites on the island, including uh, Highway 19, Lanceville, and this is the, uh, the shot that we're referencing here where uh, we had a sinkhole which affected the highway, and uh, also Highway 1 on the Malahat. We also had uh, significant impact. Um, so the damages uh, have been ranging from, uh, from simple shoulder washout, uh, fill, failed drainage infrastructure to failed retaining wall structures and road and bridge washouts. So we would consider we're now uh, essentially through the, the initial response phase. Um, 
uh, which is, you know, basically just dealing with the, the emergent, uh, you know, situation. And now in the, in the recovery phase uh, where we're in the process of planning all the, the needed repairs. So that's just, uh, again, something, uh, you know, of extraordinary nature that uh, we felt was worth, worth sharing with, uh, with this group. All right, and now to move on. So to our, uh, looking ahead to our 2022 program. Uh, so we've got a few, a few things on the, on the book here that are worth mentioning. So we are uh, planning um, a significant uh, resurfacing uh, project. Uh, this is out on Knight Road where we are looking to complete uh, resurfacing work and shoulder widening to accommodate to 1.5 meter shoulders on both sides of the road. And this will be in the, the narrow section between the, the, the Summerside Tax Shop and Kai Bay Road. Uh, on our district project side, we are also looking at implementing chain-up sign improvements uh, along the Strath Strathcona Parkway. And then on the planning front, uh, we are looking at um, the intersections of Highway 19A at Merville and Sackville Road and Coleman Road. And we'll be looking to develop and evaluate options for safety and mobility improvements for the future. So that concludes a look at our 2022 program and our presentation. So I'd just like to thank everyone again for the, for the opportunity to present. And yeah, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to, to, to go through them. We always have questions. So I'm sure I'm <laughs> gonna let Director Grief go first. Thank you very much to both of you for bringing this uh, to our attention here at the Electoral Area Services Committee. And don't make yourself strangers. It'd be nice to see you more than even once or twice a year. Um, First of all, I just want to draw attention to the general from the general public to the fact that what a great job the regional district did at snow removal this year. <laughs> Seriously, though, there's still people out there that think that uh, that don't realize that the, the great job that the uh, province and the contractors do, and the amount of money it would cost if we had that service housed within our electoral area services committee. So good on you. I just want to know, uh, you know, if you look at uh, 4,100 metric tons put on the road. So obviously <laughs> that's, that's no small beans there. Um, I wanted to make a, a couple of points. I think Director Arbor would probably chime in um, about the, uh, it's nice to see the, uh, the back road uh, multiple trail. And wouldn't it be lovely to have those all over the valley? You know, it would be a great thing. Um, but, uh, you know, one question I do have is regarding the, um, the Comox logging road. I was under the misconception that that was a private road. Is it a public road then? The, the Comox logging road? Uh, yeah. Where, where exactly are you, are you, uh, interested in looking at? While you were talking uh, about the uh, the job you did uh, seal coating, the uh, seal coating the uh, the road up to the Bevan Road, Comox oh, Logging Road. Oh yes, uh, sorry, Lake Trail Road. Was it on Lake Trail or was it uh, at, on the actual logging road? Yeah, I haven't been yeah, up there for right. a while yeah, this it year. It was on uh, on the Lake Lake Trail Road itself. Which is on the Lake Trail. Okay, that makes sense. Otherwise, I'd be pushing to have it uh, chip sealed all the way to uh, Stoughton, Stoughton Falls and the bridge, which would be great if uh, one day that could be taken into the public. Um, one thing I did want to bring up, though, um, was around the fact that uh, I think you guys are the, uh, the authority over uh, uh, lights on the highway. And I bring your attention to the fact that uh, the new Merville Fire Hall is nearing completion. And uh, I think we will be coming for a request for a, a flashing red light at that, at that corner. Um, it's a small straightaway there just, uh, just south of, um, of Women's Beach Road. And I think that in past, uh, the Oyster River Fire Department truck had been rear-ended by, by a driver with all its lights flashing on the way to a fire because uh, they weren't allowed to put in a flashing red light. So I'm just wondering um, in future, whose uh, who's doorstep should I be darkening and whose phone should I be phoning with regards to getting one put in for safety reasons for the fire department? 
Okay, yeah, you can certainly touch base with me for any uh, proposals that'll be involving some infrastructure along our, our highway, and then we could definitely work with you alongside our uh, our development services branch for, for any uh, permit applications and, and uh, information that we would need in order to, to support something like that. And just one more thing, if it may, Madam Chair. What the hell happened to Farnham Road? After the last snowfall, it looks like it's, a, it's full of potholes, much like it looked before it was uh, it was uh, the chip seal before. So was that just uh, due to the, the snow we had and the, and the frost heaves? Do we have all those potholes again now? If you like, Kellen, I can I can speak to that one a little bit. Um, yeah, you're you're right on the money there. The the amount of moisture that got through that road and then the plows on it, and we had heavy industrial traffic for a bit before that on it. Um, it it took a serious beating. So um, we're trying to pothole patch it as much as possible, but with the chip seal road, uh, those those yeah. patches don't work as well as they would on a full asphalt road. Um, but uh, it's it's on our list of priorities, absolutely. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a crying shame. A bit of a crying yeah, shame, actually. An unfortunate uh, side yeah. effect of these events we had, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Director Grieve. Director Arbor? Thanks, Madam Chair, uh, and great to host you guys. Um, I guess I'll start. You know, my first degree was in geography, and, and I guess the term of, the, of 2021 was atmospheric river, right? That didn't used to exist. It emerged in 2019. But then I realized, oh, Pineapple Express. Okay, so Pineapple Express is a type of atmospheric river. And in the future, just as trivia, they have actually have different grades of atmospheric river. There's seven grades from weak to extreme. So eventually we'll talk about extreme atmospheric rivers. But uh, it's interesting when you get a, a brand new term in, in a field that tends to be stagnant. Um, thank you for all the information. Obviously, there's a, that's one of the most often asked questions uh, to us. As you well know, a lot of people think that we manage the roads in rural areas, which we don't. We always have to clarify that. Um, we, I, I have a couple of questions. One is around... Um, Maybe the need for, um, or what I see as a need for a partnership with the ministry in the future. Um, Dr. Grieve kind of touched on this, but you're probably aware that in September we released our active transportation network plan, and that's a long range plan with um, at least probably 30 priorities identified, ranging to maybe 400 million bucks, 80 million. Thank you, Alan. Um, by the time we get those done, it'll probably be fine. <laughs> but obviously, well beyond the purview of local government. In fact, for a lot of these things, we don't really have a service. Um, so we understand partnerships with the municipalities is, is, is probably a little easier when you work on some of those corridor access. In fact, you identified one completed this year at uh, uh, the top of the hill across from North Island College, Cowichan Avenue. And that one was pretty funny because other than the Fifth Street Bridge on Facebook and elsewhere, that was the most commented topic of the year. And people thought it would be an absolute disaster when, when the light was put in. The light was put in and then it's totally fine. So I, I think the ministry was, was correct on that one. Let's hope um, that, uh, that issues like that uh, get addressed. Uh, Right from the forego, from from the get go, in terms of um, your so my question is about your priorities forward and how would we go about advocating to your bosses at the ministry around how we're going to implement um, the active transportation plan because we may be able to invest some dollars, but um, I I still don't understand how the ministry may prioritize project in the rural areas. There's the safety aspect. I realize some of the projects you identify. Safety is top of mind. So I was looking at your um, vehicle collisions and casualties in the rural areas. And it, it's clear that, you know, Ham Road is identified, Buckley Bay at Highland Highway. Ham Road is both at the Inland Highway, Island Highway. So you probably have a very limited budget to tackle some of those safety issues. Do you feel you have flex to then look at other things? Because there's, as Director Grief said, you did the back road, which is in the city of Courtney, I think. No, it's in Airbnb. And uh, 
but we've identified some really cool features uh, and needs, for example, in Royston, on Royston Road from Marine Drive to the school. That's, I think, the community has been advocating for 40 years for uh, better shoulder walkability, safety as they walk their kids to school. Uh, Union Bay has great opportunities, again, along the foreshore. So my, my question to you is, what, what's the best way to engage with the ministry? Like, should we have more meetings together? Should we just go straight to the minister for, for bigger uh, budget envelopes so that you can better collaborate with us? And any advice you have? Because from the outside in as elected official, it's not, it's not clear what the best path is to, um, to up the level of collaboration from basically a handful of projects this year to something that in our active uh, transportation plan is much more ambitious in the long term. Yeah, no, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so I think the recommendation would be to, um, to continue to work through through us as your, your local district office to be the, you know, your primary voice for, uh, for, for these future improvements. And, you know, we at the district will be, you know, able to, like say, be, you know, aware of our, our ministry's future programs and be able to work alongside you on, uh, you know, how we can implement these alongside our, our program. Uh, so we do currently meet, uh, you know, on, like, on a quarterly basis with the, the regional district at this time, you know, always happy to, to coordinate additional meetings where, where necessary. But I think, uh, you know, I think um, communication directly with us is a, is a great avenue for us to, you know, look for um, uh, synergies in our, in our priorities and our programs. Um, and then as well, uh, UBCM is, of course, the, you know, the, uh, particularly for our, our municipalities, the, you know, the voice for, um, for, for local government to, to bring forward uh, projects and priorities to our, our, uh, to our ministry. Thank you for that. Um, and I just have a, 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 I hope a small question. Um, you know, Kellen, you've, you've highlighted um, some extreme weather events that we had in 2021 with both um, the uh, heavy um, snowfall, but then also these atmospheric rivers of, in high quantities of water. And I'm just wondering, uh, from a ministry, ministry point of view, um, are you looking at increasing budgets to address these extreme weather events that are having, you know, such a huge impact on infrastructure, especially roads and highways? Well, I, I think we're always looking to 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 put together our, our priorities and and uh, put additional programs together where you know where funding permits, you know, to 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 help us, like say, on that front of. Uh, planning ahead for uh, you know for for culvert uh, replacements, making drainage improvements, and you know um, our resurfacing programs and various different safety and and um, community uh, you know related projects. So uh, I, I wouldn't be able to give you any more specifics to you know any sort of increase or, or further amount, but um, you know certainly we're always looking to. To, to make sure that the area's priorities are, are adequately captured and, and do the best we can to tackle them through our through our project uh, and programs. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions. So I wanna thank both of you, uh, both of you for, for coming and presenting. Um, as Director Grief said, it's always great to, to hear how the ministry is working um, since we don't have control over our, our own roads and, and highways. So on receipt then, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thanks again. The next item up we have is the Saratoga Speedway Complex Concerned Citizens for their Delegation for Receipt. Okay. Moved and seconded. And I'm going to hand it over to Niels, Shelley, and Jonathan for their presentation. <laughs> And you'll just have to hit the button on your speaker and I can on the light. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair and Director Hamir, Director Grieve and Director Arbour and CVRD staff. We appreciate the opportunity to address you on this pivotal community issue. Some weeks ago, we submitted a document presenting our concerns and we trust that you've had an opportunity to review it. Section 4451 of the Local Government Act, RSPC 2015 C1 states, and I quote, all bylaws adopted by a regional district board after the board has adopted a regional growth strategy 
and all services undertaken by a regional district after the board has adopted a regional growth strategy must be consistent with the regional growth strategy. I will begin my presentation. I'm Neil Holbeck, by the way, from Black Creek by focusing on areas of the community concerns that have been identified. Many of these concerns are inconsistent with the CBRD Regional Growth Strategy 2011, and therefore presumably subject to 445 of the Local Government Act. Subsequently, Shelley Hollingshead will share insights into how challenging this rezoning application has been for many residents in our community. And lastly, Jonathan Brenner will share the current results of our petitions and conclude our presentation. Page 88 of the Regional Growth Strategy states that uses within settlement nodes will be identified within the Comox Valley Regional District and will have a local area plan. That provides for specific land uses and development criteria. A draft local area plan for the Saratoga settlement area was initiated but has not been completed. It seems incongruous that the CVRD would consider this application in the absence of a completed local area plan, primarily when the lack of a local area plan is inconsistent with the regional growth strategy. We therefore request that the application be withheld until, until such time as a local area plan has been completed. The draft local area plan did not contemplate 168 RV campsites as requested in the application. This is equivalent to adding a small village to our community. The draft plan called for maintaining and protecting the existing rural community character. Page 82 of the Regional Growth Strategy aims to promote intensification, compact growth, and supportive public transit services throughout municipal areas, municipal areas, as the primary means of accommodating population and employment growth within the CBRD. The addition of 168 RV campsites in the absence of a community plan appears inconsistent with the regional growth strategy. We therefore request that the application be withheld until such time as a local area plan has been completed. Climate change is here and we will not escape unscathed, as the previous presenters indicated in a small microcosm of what's going on. The Comox Valley Sustainability Strategy has adopted a long-term target of 80% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from 2007 levels by 2050, with a midterm target of a 50% reduction by 2030. The Regional Growth Strategy, page 70, has adopted the same target as the Comox Valley Sustainability Strategy. Sadly, there has been no data available to indicate if the CVRD is anywhere close to achieving these targets in the 10 years since the Regional Growth Strategy was adopted but I understand something may come next year. An increase in speedway use as well as international travel to and from regional racing events will result in higher greenhouse gas emissions. The application is therefore inconsistent with the regional growth strategy. What message is the CVRD sending to the community and society? If it chooses the path of encouraging this increase in recreational greenhouse gas emissions. The CVRD should submit an application referral request to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. We therefore request that the application be withheld until such time as the CVRD has, re CVRD has received and refu reviewed a referral from the Ministry and can demonstrate that it is achieving the Regional Growth Strategy emissions target. There are approximately 750 meters of agricultural land reserve frontage across from the Macaulay Road properties under application. There's no mention of this property boundary in the application or in any of the preliminary reviews by the CVRD. The regional growth strategy on page 98 states agriculture is an important aspect of the Comox, Valley, Comox Valley's economic and cultural landscape and should be protected and enhanced. An expanded speedway complex will compromise the future potential for farming on these adjacent lands. For further input, the CVRD should submit an application referral request to the Agricultural Land Reserve Commission and the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries. We therefore request that the application be withheld until such time as the CVRD has received referrals from the ALR and the Ministry and that the application becomes consistent with the Regional Growth Strategy. The Regional Growth Strategy on page 87 states that the location of the application should be serviced by sewer. We therefore request that the application be withheld until such time as sewers are in place and consistent with the Regional Growth Strategy requirement. The proponent's application of November 5th, 2020 states, and I quote, we understand the concern with noise from the site. No new noise will be created 
from the site, unquote. It's unequivocally clear that even prior to a possible expansion of the racetrack noise, uh, noise has been dramatically louder and more frequent since proponents purchased the racetrack. The memorandum from Pacific Acoustics dated July 26, 2021 is grossly inadequate, a grossly inadequate assessment. To the best of our knowledge, there's been no effort by the CVRD to independently assess the noise coming from the track during the past year, in spite of the many complaints and requests to do so. This should be undertaken in 2022. The CVRD must ensure that the proponents are capable of meeting the no new noise commitment prior to any consideration of the application. If the proponents are able to achieve this commitment, unable to concede to achieve this commitment now, it seems highly unlikely that they will be motivated or able to do so in the future. We therefore request that the application be withheld until a credible noise study is done by the CBRD and the proponents have demonstrated they can achieve their documented no new noise commitment. The following environmental issues, while not directly addressed in the regional growth strategy, remain areas of concern to the community. Local groundwater availability, possible future demands on the Black Creek Oyster Bay water system, surface water infiltration, water pollution and rainwater management, a potential contaminated site, reduction of summer flows and higher water temperatures in the Black Creek and the Oyster River comprising fish, and lastly, the CVRD dark skies policy. Furthermore, there have also, there have also been uh, traffic congestion complaints during last year's racing season. And in spite of the traffic study, we are concerned that traffic management has not been adequately addressed. I will now pass the microphone to Shelley Hollingshead, we'll, who will speak to some of the societal issues related to this application. Shelley, if you want to just press the button. When we speak of our concerns about this application, we have been denounced as fear mongers, not living in the community, being NIMBYs and distributing misinformation. Actually, our coordinating group all live in Area C. Many of us have resided in the community for decades, some for most of our lives. We live and shop here. We participate in and support community activities. We love the character of our rural community. And we're very worried about the negative impacts of this rezoning application. It's very disheartening and discouraging to read the referral letter from Saratoga and Miracle Beach Residents Association, which ignores our concerns. Sambra has not had any residence meetings for over two years, and its membership consists of five people that apparently weren't all polled for this letter of referral. The chair also admits that residents have not been polled, nevertheless proceeds to comment on the application. We've heard from a number of long-term residents who are considering moving from the area because of the unpredictable increased frequency and volume in speedway noise and its disruption in their lives. We are aware of an increased anxiety in those who talk about a visceral reaction to the speedway activity that they have say has increased significantly this year. A local resident tracked speedway activity for 10 days last summer. Four days were scheduled events. The other six were unscheduled for a total of nine hours. This raises the issue of being unable to plan our own activities due to the excessive interruption. Island Health in their referral letter raises very similar concerns to ours by saying high noise levels can not only be a nuisance, but can result in sleep disturbances, fatigue, and other mental and health issues. There are over a thousand places for people to stay in, a, in and around our beautiful community. Over and above those accommodations is the availability of thousands more in the surrounding area. People question the need for more RV spaces and their consequential infrastructure needs and environmental impact. We determined during our local area planning process in 2016 that we wanted a peaceful, sustainable, livable, rural residential community with a focus on coastal tourism. Let's work towards that. Jonathan. Thanks, Shelley. <clears throat> 
As elected officials and proponents of due process, we're asking you to listen to over 800 individuals willing to put their name to paper in opposition of the application. The majority of them signed by Black Creek residents. They're asking you to listen to us through their signatures. Here are just a few of the many comments from the electronic petition that opposed the Speedway complex expansion. In quotes, using obnoxiously loud fossil fueled vehicles as entertainment and approving projects that put more stress on, the, on our natural resources is so backwards, shows a complete lack of foresight and turns a blind eye to today's relevant issues. This kind of entertainment is not what most tourists want when they visit our area, being marketed as a place to explore and enjoy nature. The few part-time lower wage jobs created are not worth the aggravation caused to so many citizens who live in the area. Another, I am disappointed to hear that the owners of the Speedway would actually consider an expansion of the Speedway complex at this time when climate change and its impact on the health of our local environment and our communities is so at risk. I look to you to consider carefully how such an expansion can possibly be considered in the best interests of our community plan. And finally, all for the sake of one person's dream, we may have to live with the nightmare. I hope you've heard their voices. These are the 800 people. In conclusion, a zoning application is not the time or the process to decide what this community wants. This community has made it very, very clear that it wants a completed local area plan first. This plan needs to be completed prior to consideration of the application so that community engagement will actually direct our future. Today, we urge you to withhold this rezoning application from proceeding until such time as the important actions identified in this presentation have been undertaken. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before I start off with questions from directors, I just want to acknowledge that uh, this is exactly what we're doing. We're listening to the, the community and, and, and your, your message has been heard very, very well. So um, I will open it up to questions. Um, Director Arbor. Thank you. That was a, a really clear presentation and well done, well prepared. Um, and it's nice to see everybody here. It's actually been two years since we've had this amount of people. We've had a couple of people once, but uh, I guess six months ago, it's actually nice to see people in person. Um, even though this is obviously a hugely contro controversial and consequential topic for the community around Saratoga and Black Creek. Um, so I obviously, um, you know, whenever new proposals are considered, uh, process is key. So I, I won't focus on the uh, um, some of the substantive things, but in terms of the process things, I want to make sure that uh, staff can answer a couple of questions. One is, well, two really. One is, um, so I'm aware, and I, I actually took the time to review the. Uh, the draft local area plan from 2015, 2016. So I'll just list my questions and maybe Tom or, or appropriate staff will answer all through Russell, I guess. But um, so, so I, I'd love a bit of information on why the local area plan was not ratified at the time, because it looks like a fairly complete piece of work that can still be found on our website. So. I know we discussed the Comox Valley Sustainable Literary Strategy that never got ratified, so I got the goods on that one. But I don't have the reason as to why the effort was kind of suspended after 2016. Um, associated with that is obviously staff is, is putting a recommendation to move forward. So that leads into my second set of question, which is one is, uh, did staff consider the local area plan in its role uh, 
in relation to an implication such as this. And second, um, when it comes to the referral in the presentation we just heard, there was uh, questions about, and I don't know if, you know, I don't know what the status is, but again, a referral to the Ministry of Environment and the Agricultural APC, why that, that may or may not have been included. So those would be my three just to, to get us uh, started on, on the better understanding of the issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Directors. And uh, I'm going to refer the questions to Tom True and Jody McLean, who are here from our planning department. Hello, through the chair to the directors and uh, uh, everybody. Uh, so work on that LAP was paused in recognition of some work that the engineering staff was doing concerning the Black Creek Oyster Bay water service area. And it's come to light since then also that the coastal floodplain mapping project uh, may have revealed some uh, risk assessment that needs to be done that would affect the LAP process. Um, staff is, doesn't believe that the, there's any policy gaps between the local area plan and what the official land plan provides. So we've proceeded uh, on basis of the official community plan. I think there was also a question about referral to the, the other ministries. Yes. So it was not believed at the time that the impacts or the concerns of the interests of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change would be uh, impacted by this proposal, so it was not sent to them. Uh, on the agricultural Ministry of Agriculture, uh, similarly, um, we would send those if there was a proposal being done on farmland or on, on inside the agricultural land reserve. Uh, in this case, the regional district has its own uh, development permits for the protection of farmland but it, it exempts, it provides an exemption when the farmland is across a road. So that road becomes the farmland protection buffer. Uh, so that's uh, why those wasn't sent. Great, thanks. Question answered? All right. Um, my question is actually to the, the delegation. Um, and maybe a comment first. Um, I think the delegation understands that that the application coming forward is not regarding the actual activity of the speedway. Um, so around the climate um, considerations, I, I hear the, the, the issues. That activity is not being contemplated for, for change. But what we are looking at is um, the impact of the camp area and the other um, uh, activities. So I'm wondering in the petition, have um, have residents come or recited uh, issues that they have with the, the camping specifically and the, and, and the activities that are in the application? And if you could um, respond to that, yeah. Here. And Thank you, Madam Chair. It is a really good question. And um, although those issues around climate change and et cetera, as you mentioned, are not typically, you know, focused right on the RV campsite. There is relevancy, and um, what we look at is it's drawing greater numbers to that area that will be coming from longer distances, probably, to be able to camp, stay for the week, and and increase usage of of the actual uh, speedway. This is going to increase greenhouse gas emissions. We are shifting from what we see is a one evening and one Saturday evening to uh, for their the regular activities that they have had in the past to a significant increase now. The RV campsite is going to support those kinds of activities to see an increase in the usage. That usage, which we've seen in this past summer, as much as six out of seven days one week is being promoted by having the campsite. That increased usage is going to be relevant to the greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 uh, issues that we're seeing. It does reflect on the climate change and that's why we do bring it forward. There are other concerns about the particular campsite itself. And to be more specific with that, is that we are seeing it is a gathering of at least 168 people to that area. We feel that it'll bring more than that, maybe two to three 
So maybe about 500 people to that particular area, you know, if the campsite is full. Now, we see that during the summer hours, it's definitely going to continue to be, you know, promoted and, and used. But the reality is, is that we're going to also see this continue right through the year. Although there are uh, recommendations that there'll be only six month stays, that hasn't been typically uh, enforced in other areas of the regional district. And we see that at uh, a number of the campsites that are local in that area. We have concern that those uh, numbers will increase the requirements for infrastructure and, and services. One of them is when we add 500 new people to a community, we can see the impact. We are only about uh, 1,800 households is what I understand. So adding 500 more people to that area, that will have a significant increase in, in, in needs. One of them might be policing. We are only, uh, as far as my understanding, is the budgets that we add uh, to the policing services. Are we gonna need to look like that we need to have policing services located in Black Creek rather than responding all the way from the, the local municipal areas? Second piece is, are we gonna see an increase in, in requirements for fire response or medical responses? What is that gonna to do to the normal, already, uh, already significant issues to the highway that we're seeing now? The traffic management plan that they've put in place, there are some good pieces to it, but it falls short. It falls short for the rest of the year. It only looks at specific events, well, what about the rest of the year? And that's, that's another significant concern. Um, yes. If you'd like to add more things. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, just very briefly, um, there was certainly no, um, I would say interest uh, from the CVRD and concerns about practices which were in the past pretty much regulated to specific times. Uh, there was no um, uh, action on the noise. And um, so with the new bylaw that's been proposed, I didn't see anything about any kind of constraints on the activity. So the assumption has to be that there's gonna be more activity there. And that's certainly what uh, we've sort of uh, come to expect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have another question regarding the, the noise study, and I'm wondering if staff um, there. I, I, I noticed that the noise study was specifically around the the speedway noises, and um, are are noises from campgrounds considered a significant source of of noise in a community? I don't know if staff are, have a comment on that. So if the noise from the campground would be subject to the noise control bylaw um, that would be regulated by the by bylaw and compliance of, um, uh, department. Uh, but we're not aware of uh, just any specific complaints. On, okay. On that. So, uh, and maybe a follow-up question, um, Jody. So when a campground is a new campground is is considered, because I do note that you know across Shiloh Road um, there are residents uh, fairly nearby. Is there a minimum buffering area that's required um, in terms of, of green space or? There, there's not an automatic uh, setback. Uh, those are dealt with at the development permit stage. Uh, when it's a commercial campground, we take a look at appropriate buffers to, to, different, to adjacent uses. Um, but a but as a zoning bylaw can include uh, setbacks and buffers into the into it. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions, Director Grieve? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, for coming out in these dangerous times. I hope everybody's got got your uh, M95 masks on. Um, we're here to listen. We're here to listen to both sides of the uh, the equation. And uh, I might add that uh, there was a petition submitted this morning with uh, 17 
hundred signatures on it, contrary to your signature. So obviously, it's it's a it's a contentious issue in the community. But given, no, I'm sorry, you can't. I'm sorry. I'm Madam sorry. Chair. I'm going to ask for for just some some decorum. Thank you for the folks in the audience. Um, it's only a delegation. We, this is not. There will be a public hearing if if we move forward, and you'll have a chance to speak then. So if we can keep the questions just between the directors and and the delegation, that would be much appreciated. Thanks very much. Yeah, the the, the uh, we have to keep the level of decorum as high as we can. Um, so my my uh, my conversation with Jonathan uh, a couple of weeks ago was uh, I very much enjoyed it. We had a really good, fulsome conversation, about an hour on the phone, and I uh, got an insight into a lot of the concerns. But uh, given now that the reports are out, um, and you know, you, you mentioned things like expansion of the speedway, which is specifically spelled out that it's not going to be expanded no no footprint is going to be changed and um things like the the uh, the rainwater management plan which obviously isn't 100 percent yet but we're going to be hearing from the pony here pretty soon but i'm just wondering um was there anything in the re in our staff's report that brought you some comfort. Obviously, you see some gaps in it or something that could be done a little differently or better. But is there some is some of the fears uh, that have been laid for, by the uh, by the report? Who would like to answer that? Yeah. I got some stuff to yeah. uh, Thanks for the question, Edwin. Um, just a couple of things. Um, the uh, best thing we saw in there was the Ministry of Health sort of confirming, confirming our concerns about noise, I would have to say. Uh, with regard to your uh, reference to expansion, our view of expansion, and we probably should have clarified this better, is not so much the physical dimensions of the track, but the frequency of activity that goes on at the track. Uh, and in fact, it, it, it may be that a smaller track is actually worse than a bigger track because of all the corners and so forth and so on that are tighter. Um, and uh, with regard to the report, um, I actually say, have to say I was shocked by the uh, report by the audiologist, uh, basically looking at conclusions from one day uh, at three locations at one event. And I will pass on to you sometime in the future some work that was done in Campbell River when they were looking at the speedway or the uh, yeah, the drag strip there. And uh, taking, undertaking a, a comprehensive noise study is no small task and uh, requires frequent sampling of frequent sites under frequent conditions. And um, so I would argue that that report is, is as close to useless as you can get. So that's the one you single out in these words. But of course, just it also recognizing the fact that the proponent is under no obligation to address that, and and staff obviously um, you know have limited uh, uh, limited ability to address the noise issue. So you know it. it I'm just wondering, you know what uh, you know the the issue basically we're talking here. I think is the fact that we have a uh, a facility that that can operate regardless of the outcome of this bylaw. What we are talking about is basically a campsite. So a lot of the stuff, and I, I, you know, you can hoot and holler, but I think it, a lot of it's red herring issue. So we have to get our minds down to what we're actually talking about here in regards to rezoning a campground. And you know, just to put things in some perspective, we have, you know, we talk about greenhouse gas emissions, we talk about global warming. And, you know, it's all so mum and apple pie right now that nobody can stand in the front of it. But just to get a little bit of a perspective here, there's 11,450 vehicles daily that go over Highway 19 and Highway 19A. So that's 4,176,200,000 vehicles a year. So when you put, just saying, but, you know, just to get a sense of perspective, you know, we, we have a, a bigger issue here, bigger fish to fry than, than 
than what we're talking about with a campsite and people coming to a campsite. So I'm just wondering if if we can keep um, keep the focus on the campground and and uh, you know bring your your concerns forward around that. Um, I think I'm going to let the I'm going to let the delegation um, respond to that to that. Uh, Excuse me, you, the delegation can't be heard if people are talking over them. Thank, thank you, Director Greaves. Thank you for raising and opening that door to talk about the report. The report provides all kinds of information that supports this application. Those are actually being considered by all of you and the regional district staff. We should have opportunity if they have provided this information for us to scrutinize it, not at a public hearing, but now, because this shouldn't go any further into a public hearing state. Our conversation was excellent, Dr. Director Grieve. But you have to understand, and in using your comments, this isn't hysteria. This is a real concern for all of us here. You talk about the 11,400 vehicles or so that go up and down the road on a daily basis. We are now adding at least 500 more by the traffic due to the RV campsites. We are at, sorry, 168 sorry, 168 more vehicles to the area, pulling trailers, pulling uh, their vehicle, the vehicles that they'll be racing. We're adding to them. Why not we provide what the accident rate is on Highway 19, which is nonstop every day. We hear the sirens. Uh, nonstop. And yet this is of little concern. You also pick up a few other things in the report. Yes, again, the VIHA report was significant and it raised a couple of key issues. One, they identified this as a nuisance. Now you, as the regional district, haven't looked at the bylaw around nuisance. And I can tell you that yes, there is no noise bylaw, but the racetrack has become a nuisance and the sound. And there is a viable option to address those concerns that haven't been taken. Regarding the biophysical report, because that was part of it, it had limitations. It was confined only to the property. It didn't look beyond. It didn't look across the street to the ALR land. It didn't look to the streams that it's being polluted along the way. And a campground is going to add to those pollutions. The water that is just a direct runoff from that entire property goes direct into the highway ditch. That highway ditch, at, according to the biophysical report that was put in, goes directly to the Black Creek, directly to the Oyster River. That is our water supply. That is where fish are spawning. The audacity of Leighton Holdings to say that there was no wildlife or habitat or fish on their property is ridiculous, is unacceptable. Of course, there's nothing on there because it's all polluted. Furthermore, another aspect of this report included the Sombra uh, letter. This is no more than a small group of individuals providing their personal opinions. As it states in their letter, the residents have not been polled. This does not reflect the residents of Saratoga and Miracle Beach area. It should be treated like any other letter that's been submitted by individuals. It creates an unequal bias that may influence today's decision. This became of more concern in the recent Facebook uh, uh, discussions that were going on. The chair of Sombra claimed the info supplied by the concerned citizens is not complete and balanced, but heavily subjective and based on opinion, not fact. It also complained that many of the petition signers are not opposed to the proposal, they just have questions. 
when the statements are so misleading and untrue, as I checked the veracity of those signatures, and there was only one person that was opposed. When people make those kinds of, of accusations and, mis, and misinformations, you have to take the validity of that Sombra letter to be nil. I'm, I want to talk one more piece around the Pacific Acoustics piece. While noise isn't what we're all focused on, because we're only focused on the uh, campsite, the methodologies and limitations of the assessment shows that there's significant flaws in their evaluation of noise on the surrounding areas. One has the question, why did they only assess three sites and one sample per site and only on one day? By their own data submitted, they measured that there would be 68.7 decibels at two kilometers, two kilometers away from the Miracle Beach, uh, down Miracle Beach Drive. They also report that it could be as much as 20 decibels more moved on, uh, move more based on atmospheric conditions. The noise modeling that in, is limited to a radius of 1,000 meters by their own submission. Perhaps adding another 20 or 40 decibels if you go further down near or closer to the actual racetrack. If we start to look at the 20 that they say could be added to that 68, and if we move their assessment not two kilometers away to maybe a maybe a kilometer away, 500 meters, how about even across the street? We'd add at least another 20 or 40 decibels. We're looking at 108 to 128 decibels. And according to their document, it'd be, and, and it's actually noted on page, uh, page 12 of their document, according to their document, this would be worse than a live rock band or a locomotive 15 meters away, or a chainsaw or a jackhammer three meters away. And you, the report is there, and now we're scrutinizing it. Thank you. I've got some more questions still. So if that's all right, I'll, I'll um, move over to Director Arbor. The slides went on. Um, I don't have more questions, I don't think, but I'll, I'll just provide a comment in that. Um, you know, I think, again, I'd like to restate the delegation did a good job. It's a good conversation. And typically we have a policy that when we receive a, a delegation, we don't consider an action uh, request until the following meeting. But today you're in luck because it just so happens that you're lined up with a consideration of a report later today and where we will hear the applicant and have, and that's why I stayed away from the report because it will be, um, sorry, it will be discussed at that point. Um, it, I'm, I'm not trying to negate the value of this conversation, but just so you know, I've got two pages of notes and questions coming up later in the agenda in relation to the application. And so in a way you will get um, your request to consider whether to pause this or not addressed later on. And I think you've added a, a lot of good community perspective on it, but I don't want to adjudicate the report, uh, which is what we're starting to do before we get the staff presentation the applicant presentation and appreciate that that we got the perspective from a number of people in the community it sounds like you've got a, a lot of, of people that have backed your your report as well so that just be my opinion otherwise i think we otherwise what i'd ask madam chair is that uh you know that we bring that report forward in the presentation so we can actually have a better basis for um the questions and comments on it thank you thank you um, just a technical question for staff. Um, there's been reference to a couple of petitions. Have we received those petitions? Um, go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Hi, we can we can take this position right now, and we are aware of another petition that's currently circulating, but we've but received notification of it, but not the actual receipt. Of, receipt of okay, it. all right, thank you, uh, Director Grieve. You had a question. Yeah, just quickly, I, I agree with Director Arbor. We're going to hear the, uh, the the reports pretty quick, but I just want to throw it out there one more time. Um, you know, in, in view of the, the limited purview of what we're talking about here in the rezoning application, do you see any room for compromise? 
if we uh, get uh, you know another engineer to do another report and came up with the same conclusion, would that satisfy? Would it, is there any area here where we can find agreement? You're gonna to have to repress the button, sorry. Uh, that's a challenging question. And I think we need to hear the rest of the story probably before we uh, consider that. Um, I guess I go back to concern with regard to the regional board's ability to enforce bylaws. And um, I look at the other uh, resorts in the area and um, they're under the same as same conditions as is proposed for this campsite, but they're now pretty much full all year round. Um, I look at the request for action when we say that there's more activity going on on the site than there has been in the past without any action. I talk about complaints about noise and Edwin and I, I invited you on two occasions to come out so you could experience this because I absolutely guarantee all of you that you would not tolerate the noise in my backyard and in my front yard. I'm trying to plan a family reunion this summer and I can't know when I might do that without it being absolutely ruined. And the noise has gotten just that much worse. So it's not the same as what we had before, Edwin. And I have no faith that it won't get a lot worse. I don't see any of their comments or um, lights up for here. Any, any more questions from, from the directors? Okay. Then I will call the question on receipt. All those in favor of receipt of the delegation? Opposed? And that's carried. And I wanna thank you all for coming and then having your voices heard and, and your presentation. Thank you. Do you directors wanna break or do you wanna keep, keep going? What time are they taking us out of here? Uh, we have to be out of here, I think at 2, 2.30. Yeah. Uh, do you wanna do a couple of, of uh, okay. All right, so the next item is the management report from February 2022 for receipt. Moved, and I can second. And are there any comments on the management report? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor of receipt? Any opposed? That's carried. And advisory planning commission for area A held on February 1st for receipt. Moved and seconded. Comments on that? Hearing and seeing none. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. And the first development various permit from electoral area A, 471 Leet Lane for receipt. Seconded. Moved and seconded, and I will turn it to staff. Thank you very much. And uh, Brian Chow has uh, joined us from the planning department to introduce this report and answer any of your questions. Welcome, Brian. Okay, uh, through the CEO to the chair and uh, committee members. Uh, currently, in front of you is a development variance permit application for a proposed lot line adjustment in Area A. The two subject properties are Lot 11 and Lot 12 in the Turner Road, uh, Cougar Smith Road area. And that's shown as figures one and two in the staff report. What the lot line adjustment is about is, uh, first of all, the applicant uh, owns both properties. And uh, lot 11 is located at 7336 Turner Road, and it's approximately 2.12 hectares in area. And adjacent lot, lot 12 actually has two portions which is uh, dissected or hooks across Cowie Creek. And the land area is approximately 16.48 hectares in area. What the long adjustment proposal is all about is the applicant wishes to combine the Northern uh, half of lot 12 with lot 11. 
leaving the southern portion of Lot 12 on its own, where it's entirely south of Cowie Creek. This lot line adjustment will not increase the number of lots. Because of this proposal, uh, lot 12, the proposed remainder lot 12 in the southern portion will be left with a row frontage of approximately 2%. In the zoning bylaw, there is a requirement for any subdivision, including lot line adjustment, to have a minimum row frontage of at least 10%. Therefore, in order for this lot line adjustment to proceed, one of the requirements is to obtain a development variance permit to reduce the minimum row frontage from 10% to 2%. For the benefit of the committee members, some of the reasons why we have uh, regulations or regulations on minimum row frontage is to ensure there's adequate access to the lot, to ensure that there's adequate building envelope in order to accommodate dwellings and structures, and to ensure that if the land were to be able to further subdivide in the future, that there will be adequate row frontage to permit access, future access to future lots. For this proposal, the length of the row frontage is approximately 60 meters, which would be adequate to provide row access in the future. In addition, the proposed uh, lot 12, the size is approximately 15 hectares in size, which would provide sufficient building envelope for future development. I just want to highlight the fact that currently to get to the southern portion of lot 12, um, there is a, a easement agreement with one of the lots mm -hmm. through an agreement with Island uh, Quarter Foundation to get to the subject property. So it is very likely that uh, if and when this lot line adjustments were to uh, approve and finish, the current easement agreements will continue to provide access. Planning staff is in support of this uh, reduction of road access because uh, there's enough uh, building envelope, there's enough road frontage to provide access. And Cowie Creek is a natural barrier that currently separates lot 12 into two portions. By leaving the southern portion on its own, the water course becomes a natural barrier um, to allow the remainder lot to function. Couple more comments. APC Area A met on January 4th and they supported the application and the reasons are included in the staff report. With respect to adjacent owner's letters, uh, I've not received any written confirmations. I did receive a phone call about uh, assets and I answered the question and I've not received any written feedback from this caller. So in summary, planning staff is in support of this variance. And I myself, along with the applicant, Mr. Guilford uh, Campbell, uh, he should be on the Zoom to answer any questions the commission mem committee members may have. Uh, Madam Chair. Great, thanks. Um, I'm just going to, I think we've got the applicant. Um, is he a panelist? Uh, Guilford, I think we're going to try and make you a panelist. And um, if you have any comments that you would like to add to um, staff's presentation, that would be a, a good time to do so. And you'll have to unmute yourself if you want to say anything. Hello oh, there. Hi. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he said exactly everything. Uh, the portion of the property is separated by the creek. It really has no value added to stay with lot 12. And I uh, just happened to own a lot 11. So I would, would just like to have it adjusted to it and everything's going to stay the same. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Director Arbor. No, thanks. This was um, looked at carefully at the, the APC meeting, and I think there was a good, good presentation from uh, the applicant and some good questions. Um, I found everybody, including myself, found that everything made sense in terms of uh, maintaining access, but also maybe... Uh, just realigning things so they make actually a little bit more sense for the long term. So I'm supportive of uh, approving the development permit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. I don't see any other questions um, from the director. So I'll, I'll quote unquote, excuse uh, the applicant from the table. 
And did we receive any correspondence regarding this uh, application? Uh, Madam Chair, no. Okay, great, thanks. So I think um, we're ready then just to move for receipt then. All in favor of receipt? Any opposed? And that's carried. The recommendation has been moved and I can second um, regarding the, uh, this DVP to be approved. Any comments or questions? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Yes, I think we will take, uh, a, I think actually, a, a, let's do a, a five minute recess because uh, we've got some discussion happening and yeah, thank you. So we'll return at 24 after.
Okay, I'll call the meeting back to order. The next item on the agenda is development various per variance permit 8838 Oland Road for receipt. Okay. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much. And Dylan Thiessen is here on from the planning department to introduce this application and answer your question. Great, thanks. Over to Dylan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Russell. Through the chair to the committee, a development variance permit has been, application has been received for the property at 8838 Oland Road to increase the maximum height allowed for an accessory building from seven meters to 7.6 meters. The property is approximately 2.67 hectares in size. It is owned country residential one and is designated as being within a settlement node. The owners are planning to build a principal dwelling, secondary dwelling and a garage, all of which will be built with a similar West Coast contemporary design. And the design choice requires trusses to support a sloped roof which combined with the garage doors to accommodate the vehicles they intend to store in the garage, extends the height of the building about two feet or 0 0.6 meters above the maximum height of seven meters. The advisory planning commission for area C supported the development as proposed, which at the time was for a height of 7.3 meters, but also supported an additional 0 0.7 meters to a maximum of eight meters in the event that the applicant needed to change the design slightly. Notification packages of the variance request were sent to neighbors within a 50 meter radius of the subject property and staff received correspondence from one neighbor who supported the variance request. I'll quickly note that the applicant or the owner is also pursuing the subdivision of the application through a separate process, which is why you'll see proposed lots on the subject property map and the site plan. And he has ensured that the proposed developments will all meet lot line setbacks for current and proposed lot lines. Staff are recommending that the DVP application be approved as it will not detract from the forming character of the neighborhood. It does not pose any additional considerations for privacy to or from neighbors and will not block any existing views. I was told by the applicant that he would be able to attend the meeting. I'm not sure if he's online or if there is a delay with the extended conversation this morning, but I can certainly answer any questions you might have. I'm just checking to see. I don't see him on the list of. Nope. Okay. Do you directors have any comments or questions on this uh, application? No. Nope. Um, so then I guess actually I do have a question. So I'll maybe ask the question before we then move receipt of, of the report in the addendum. Um, Dylan, so we did just i mean it feels like just um change the the height um of accessory buildings from six to seven and so i'm just concerned about now setting i was wondering when the first variance permit was going to come uh, on the seven and um seeing as this is a brand new building it's not you know building on top of a garage and concern, are, I'm just wondering if staff are concerned of the precedence setting that now we're now moving from, we've moved from six to seven and now we're moving from seven up. Thank you for the question, Madam Chair. Uh, very valid question. Certainly uh, these applications are taken on a case by case basis. We try to avoid um, the language of precedent setting um, just because we, we are taking these applications into consideration individually. Um, we do believe that the applicant has provided some mitigating factors in this context. Um, they are proposing to meet what would be the rear lot line of the new lot should the subdivision be approved, but the applicant has had conversations with staff about further offsetting that by an additional meter or so to uh, offset the impact of the height, uh, as well as the fact that the height is for the top end of a sloped roof. So the the uh, side of the building that will be closest to any neighbors will be a fair bit lower than the maximum height. Okay. So those considerations taken into account I'm led to the support. I'm going to ask a follow up. Was uh, was that brought up? Because I looked in the minutes of the uh, of the area C APC. Mm -hmm. Was the the fact that six to seven had just been changed? Was that um, broached at the APC at all? It was not at the APC. Okay. No. All right. Uh, any other questions from the directors? Okay, 
Oh, well, now I've got one here, Director Harper. No, actually, it's fine. I thought the APC, I misread that. I thought the APC had recommended 7.3, kind of halfway, but uh, I misread that line, right? So it's all good. That's correct. Yeah, the applicant originally proposed 7.3 meters. The APC members um, wanted to extend even further support to avoid seeing the application come back to the APC in the event that something did need to change because they considered it quite minor in nature. So they granted a little bit above and beyond what the applicant was originally requesting. Okay. Um, on receipt then, uh, all in favor of receipt of staff report. And that's carried. And um, can I have a motion to um, approve the addendum? Moved and seconded. And any comments on the, uh, the communications we have? And it was in favor. Okay. And so on receipt of the addendum, then all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Okay. So then we have a recommendation. Second. Moved and seconded. And are there any comments on the, the motion? Okay, I, I am gonna comment. Um, I will probably be voting no because um, of the precedent setting. I don't, thought, I don't see the need for a building, an accessory to be that high, especially if it's being built from scratch. Um, and I don't want this to be, you know, moving forward, uh, just a, a new variance that's going to be coming to us um, more and more. So we'd just like to have that hard line. Director Arbor. That's a good point, Madam Chair. I mean, you know, maybe in five years from now, we'll try to move from seven to eight meters and then from eight to nine and yeah. nine to 10. I think people are getting taller. That's true. That. You know, you go uh, in my hometown in Quebec City, you get the old houses and the ceilings are like five and a half feet. People used to be really small, short. Um, uh, this said, I would say let's monitor. I don't wanna, I, I'll probably vote, vote in favor, um, but I think you're right. It, it's good to, uh, and maybe for planning staff to hear that message that this was recently done and, and it's true, right? Um, I mean, you, we could open the whole debate of the entire total size of footprints of homes and all those things that actually tie to the RGS and our climate goals and all those things. We won't go there today. <laughs> We're not doing an OCP review today. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, for, for the sake of having had the area APC, uh, the APC of Area C uh, supported, I'll, I'll vote in favor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Director Brief? Yeah, just a little background on the APC meeting. It was felt, and it has been expressed before, why do these variants always come before us on heights, whereas we're allowed to do uh, lot line setbacks without having to go to APC and, and get this kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of variance. Um, it was also felt that the, uh, the developer, uh, his engineer, it was, it was costing quite a lot more. I can't remember, like, like $10,000 more to, to make it this height from what it could be, where that's why they, they said, well, why don't we allow them a little bit more leeway, might be able to save themselves some money on, on, on the roof line. When, uh, when in actuality, I said there was, there was no concern in the neighborhood and no, no visible impact. You can see it's, it's pretty well all trees, right? So the feeling is, is again, is you know why why do we always get so hung up on heights and not setbacks to property lines? Well, we've been asking that question for twelve years. Thanks. Great. Thanks for the comments. I'll call the question on the recommendation. Then, uh, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is the rezoning of uh, Punt Ledge Black Creek um, for Layton Holdings uh, for receipt. Second. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And uh, Judy McLean is here to introduce the, um, the, uh, the staff report, answer your questions and introduce the applicant as well. Great, thanks. Over to Jody. <laughs> All right, thanks to the chair, to the directors. <clears throat> so this proposal was introduced to the committee back in May, 2021. 
and external referrals to gather feedback were issued afterwards. The resulting feedback from the referrals are all in Appendix A of your package. In addition to those responses, the Area C Advisory Planning Commission reviewed it and supported the proposal. And the CVRD received over 300 pieces of written correspondence from members of the public addressing the proposal. Some were in support, some were in opposition, and numerous offered comments and observations without expressing support or opposition. The report in front of you addresses all the topics that were mentioned in the referrals and the correspondences. And I'll briefly go over some of them. The report concludes with a draft bylaw in Appendix C and its staff's recommendation that the draft bylaw be given first and second reading. So refresh your memory a little bit on it. The proposal includes five lots, inclusive of the lot that the Saratoga Speedway operates. The owner would like to redevelop the lands to add a campground over eight hectares of it. A commercial lot uh, adjacent to the Island Highway and to expand the area in which outdoor recreation uses can occur. The auto racing here was approved, was an approved use up until 1986 when the zoning bylaw underwent a comprehensive update and that resulted in it moving to an accessory use list, which required a tourist accommodation be the principal use. So since then, and currently, it operates as a lawfully non-conforming use, and it may continue to operate as such. Lawful, lawfully non-conformance non prohibits the expansion, but only in such a way that a zoning bylaw could measure, such as siting, size, and dimensions. While the number and duration of events may have fluctuated over the years, uh, the zoning bylaw does not regulate the, those events. The most common topic addressed in the responses was concerning sound being generated on the property, being heard across the community, and a concern that that will continue or escalate in the future. While numerous correspondences noted that they found the sound to be enjoyable, many found it to be disruptive and affecting the enjoyment of their property. From the regulatory perspective, a zoning bylaw cannot regulate or prohibit the generating of noise. That is done through a noise control bylaw. A zoning bylaw can have an effect on mitigating the disruption caused by sound through the separation of uses and through setbacks and buffering on site. In this case, the draft bylaw proposes a buffer of 15 meters adjacent to any res abutting residential lot. And that buffer may consist of any combination of vegetation, berms, or solid fencing. As well, the bylaw, draft bylaw there has a 30 meter setback for the repairing of vehicles associated with auto, that auto racing. Also, the draft bylaw includes fixing the length of the track so the track lengths would not be able to expand. And the owner has also pursued separate voluntary noise mitigation measures as described in Appendix B of your package, which they can elaborate upon afterwards. Another common topic of concern was the impact on the Black Creek Oyster Bay Water Service. That system has suspended new connections until a capacity issue is resolved. The campgrounds anticipate a water demand would exceed what could be offered through that existing connections. So the applicant is pursuing an independent on-site system. With professional reports, they have verified the sufficient water capacity and quality exists. And that system would be regulated by the Island Health Authority and would not be able to connect the Black Creek Oyster Bay water system. The CVRD engineering department has reviewed and confirmed that the independent system would have no hydraulic connectivity to the Black Creek Oyster Bay groundwater intake. Once the BCOB's water capacity issues are resolved and the moratorium on new connections are lifted, that campground would be eligible to connect the larger public system. Regarding surface water drainage, the applicant's rainwater management plan notes that the land is mostly within the Black Creek watershed. 
as access drainage would flow to, to culverts under the island highway and eastward to the sea. Only during significant rain events would the water be able to continue northwards past the culverts uh, into the Oyster River. To accommodate excess drainage, the rainwater management plan recommends using a stormwater pond uh, on the eastern end of the lot. There is also a request to limit the campfire smoke. However, a zoning bylaw may not be used to prohibit or regulate fires. These, these properties are within the Black Creek Oyster Bay Fire Protection Service, uh, and they have appropriate regulations to address fires. The operator of the campground also has the ability to privately enforce their own campfire rules. On traffic, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure requires a traffic impact study to maintain satisfactory levels of service and the applicant has been pursuing this with them. Because this bylaw affects land adjacent to a numbered highway, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure must sign the bylaw before it can be adopted. The principal access is intended to be off the island highway where there exists in turning lanes and it avoids sending commercial and recreational traffic down local residential roads. The draft bylaw in front of you would regulate the campground portion in much the same way as the zone, larger zoning bylaw regulates other campground zones. Like the others, the CBRD would enforce maximum stays of six months, though the, op, though the private operator may enforce shorter stays. Like the other campground zones, the, this, like the other campgrounds, the zoning bylaw would regu only regulates the minimum size of campsites and not the number of campsites. And as mentioned, it would, the draft bylaw has a 15 meter buffer adjacent to any residential lots uh, along the campsite also. Madam Chair, uh, this proposal is entirely located within the regional growth within what the regional growth strategy and official community plan call the settlement node. These are areas intended to accommodate development, especially that which promotes complete communities where people can live, play, work, and shop. And in this case, the Saratoga Miracle Beach settlement node also promotes coastal tourism. The proposed campground and expanded recreational offerings are consistent with these objectives. Therefore, staff is recommending that the draft bylaw be given first and second reading so the file can continue on to the public hearing stage. Thank you. Um, and before we move on, I'm just going to stress, um, there are no comments to be made from the audience, please. This is not a public hearing. Um, and do we have the applicant as well? Thank you. Welcome. And you just have to press your button. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Directors, uh, for having us here this morning and be able to present to you. My name is Kevin Brooks. I'm a senior planner with McElhaney Consulting, and I've been working with Mr. Layton over the past year uh, and a little bit on this file. We have a brief presentation, much of the same things as uh, Mr. McLean has touched base on. Um, go over a bit of the history, a bit of the proposal, some of the concerns that we heard from the community, some of what we're proposing to address some of those concerns, and then provide an opportunity for you to ask us any questions you may have of us. Great, we're just pulling that presentation up. Sure. Thank you very much. So if we look at the history of the site, the, the Speedway itself has been in operation for over 50 years now. Uh, it has evolved since that time in 1968 when the Speedway was first established to what it is now with a Speedway that facilitates 300 teams in, um, in 22 different divisions. The people that make up the racers and the, the people that utilize it are many, many locals and many tourists from all over British Columbia come to the site uh, for the experience and for the e events that do occur there. So why have we proposed the amendments? And Mr. McLean went over this. 
we're looking at regularizing and cleaning up the zones to really match the use on the site. Uh, the, not only the historical uses, but all to, also to reflect some of our proposed uses of having that uh, campground. The existing zone, as you can see here, the tourist commercial one zone, actually permits our campground uh, currently in support of these kinds of uses. And with the reorganization of the site, the addressing the old mill site, things of that nature, it's about how to regularize that and allow the, these consistent uses across the overall site. As Mr. McLean has said, the proposal fundamentally is to add 168 uh, stall campground in support of some additional tourist commercial uses, such as an electric go-kart track, a park, and facilities of that nature. Throughout the process, of course, we have heard many of the concerns that the community has raised. And we've looked at each of these concerns and are proposing to try to mitigate what we can of these concerns. Uh, as the delegation had mentioned, we did have an acoustical engineer assess the site and look at the, those noise concerns. And we, we cannot alleviate all the noise concerns. It's, it, it, it is a noise generating activity. But what we can do is try to limit as, as much as possible based on the recommendations in that report. A couple of those are recommendations for things such as soft landscaping to absorb sound. Uh, berming and fencing, which we are going to do along the campground and in the area. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Layton has begun doing some of that work now. Also, as mentioned, Mr. Uh, Mr. Layton, uh, from through an operational perspective, he will be putting in rules of a maximum 95 decibel within 100 feet requirement for all cars, requiring muffling on those cars to limit the noise generation from those vehicles when being utilized at this speedway. When we look at speedway operations, Historically, their average, uh, the average number of events per year was about 42 to 43 events per year. Max, the maximum number of events that have ever occurred at the site were 55 events in 2006. Mr. Layton, from an operational perspective, is looking at doing 34 events per year. Uh, that's consistent with what occurred last year and what, and what he plans on proceeding in the future. With that, a Thursday, uh, Thursday evening or Thursday afternoon, uh, practice of uh, practices. When we look at traffic, Mr. McLean mentioned exactly what we've been working with MOTI to look at traffic and how to address traffic with the per principal access being off the island highway for the majority of vehicles. One of the things we've also proposed is a road dedication to actually widen the road and access through the area. And also it proposed a park and ride, not only for events, but also to support uh, transit and uh, transit usage from the area. Uh, on off event days. Uh, water and sanitary were also addressed. Uh, principally, no new connections are going to be proposed to the Black Creek Oyster Bay system. And the re technical reports have been provided in regards to the drilling of the wells, the volume, and how we intend to facilitate uh, water for the campground. We've also had engineers review it and look at how to create uh, type two and type three uh, treatment facilities for the campground to address any sanitary issues that uh, associated with the site. Uh, the environmental reports were also discussed. We had uh, Cindy Hanna from Strategic uh, do the initial biophysical assessment of the site. That it is an initial biophysical assessment. There's a broad biophysical assessment to characterize what's occurring on the site. Any new development specifically with the campground will require additional environmental work to ensure that as we work on that campground, if this is a successful rezoning, to address fish habitat, other habitat, bird, uh, bird breeding uh, periods and things of that nature as the development was to occur. And certainly, and certainly, last but not least, is campground operations. And the campground operations, uh, the campground operations have been mentioned. We actually proposed as part of our proposal a three month cap on stays at the campground. Uh, staff have uh, suggested that a six month stay just for consistency with the existing zoning bylaw that's in place. Oh, there we go. So, in summary, um, 
the speedway uh, is intended to continue to be operated and maintained as it has been historically. And Mr. Layton, uh, like, as I'd mentioned, plans to hold uh, 34 events a year with Thursday practices. We're proposing a new campground, and that's the focus of what we're doing, is proposing the new campground to provide additional tourist, com uh, tourist commercial services in the area with some supporting recreational activities, such as electric go-karts, uh, such as uh, park in the area, which will be located con con uh, adjacent to the existing commercial uses, such as the mini golf and those tourist commercials that are located in the area. All the uses that we have proposed are actually currently permitted in the existing zoning, just in a way that uh, to establish them on the site is actually very challenging because of the uh, incongruence of the actual zoning, the split zoning, and the configuration of the parcels. With that, we're happy to take any questions that uh, your chair or the directors may have of us. Great, thanks. Uh, do directors have questions? I see uh, Director Grief. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, you touched on a few things there. Um, obviously, there's a lot of work that's gone into this. Um, one of the issues around the campground, and, and yeah, let's keep focused on the campground, uh, is that um, you said there'd be more environmental assessment done when you build a campground. And I know um, the preliminary uh, 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 planning on the campground, uh, there was some talk about um, uh, putting covenant on the trees so you can keep the, 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 the trees intact. Because I know your idea was to uh, save as much as possible. Okay. The I'm going to call, sorry, I'm going to call a recess just a second because uh, we, we can't continue like this. Oh, just a sec. No, I think uh, actually Chair Kettler um, came and visited the site and she brought it up because, of course, the Cumberland Forest product, uh, Project up there. So they're very sensitive to to deforestation in any shape or form in Cumberland. So um, what was the outcome of that? Through the chair, uh, to Councillor Grief, uh, to Director Grief. Uh, we have had conversations in regards to tree retention on the campground when it is developed. One of the things that uh, through conversation with uh, staff is actually the campground size, increasing the campground size, the standard campground size in the existing zoning ball is I believe about 110 square meters per uh, campsite. We're proposing 250 square meters per campsite to allow for greater tree retention. There has been some discussion on how to deal with that potentially as part of the zoning ball and stuff like that. But at this stage, I'm not aware of any uh, recommendation that has been made to us from staff. But the intent was was uh, recognized. Correct. So, so through, okay. okay. And through, through the chair, yes. Uh, it, the intent to retain trees on the eight hectares as part of the campground, uh, it's, that's certainly the reason for the size of the campsites that we have proposed. Okay, and, and the other thing was uh, regarding campfires. I remember, uh, at uh, one of the preliminary meetings we had that um, there was some talk of uh, making it a no campfire campsite. And much like the, our discussion with the Goose Spit Bunch, um, you know, everybody pretty well has fire rings nowadays and brings a propane tank. So is that still the intent? Yeah, yeah that is definitely the intent. Um, be part of our uh, campground rules would be no campfires. We would uh, promote the propane fire pits. To be used on sites, as opposed to Miracle Beach. So okay, Miracle thanks. Beach. Don't say Miracle Beach. No, as opposed to propane fire, as opposed to fire, well, wood burning fire pits. We would be promoting propane fire pits. Okay, thank you. Um, before I move on to more more questions, I'd just like to reiterate: this is um, a time for us to hear the proponent um, undisturbed. If we do have another outburst, I'm afraid I'm going to have to clear the gallery and you'll have to watch this on YouTube. So um, we would love to have everybody stay, um, but please, you have to keep your comments to yourself, it's quiet muttering if you have to. So um, let's try not to disrupt the flow of the questions and uh, we'll move on from there. Director Arbor. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of go through the stuff and thank you for coming and presenting your proposal. Um, I did get to do a, a quick 20 minute tour and on a really rainy day, I think that's uh, that was pretty horrible weather back then, but um, just to get a sense of the land. Uh, and it was actually my first time at the Speedway, so that was neat to see that. Um, 
And it's good to see the referrals back. You know, we, we started with a, a basic idea and now we're in the thick of it, I guess, with this issue. Um, so I'll just go point by point because the staff report kind of did a good job. And, and I'd like to premise that I will, I am not, I'm quite aware that this is um, a tough issue in Black Creek and Saratoga for everybody involved. And I am aware there's good intent with the proponent, but there's real concerns in the community. So I, um, I just say that I realize we have to make a decision today around whether to uh, shoot that at public hearing. And, I, and I'll, I'll be really happy to, to hear uh, how staff and the applicant want to move forward as well later on as we have this discussion. But for now, I'll just give my feedback on the proposal. Um, so the water, um, yeah, definitely that was one of the issues identified. And the staff report does talk about um, the fact that there are available connections um, and one currently in use. And I understand the plan to actually move to an independent system, but staff mentioned a couple of times that maybe there'd be future connection. Um, so obviously that's all tied, it all goes back to that local area plan and understanding capacity. Um, it did seem like our engineering kind of signed off at least on the, not signed off, sorry, not supposed to use the word signed off, but they, they advised <laughs> that it seems like uh, the, the well would likely not impact the, uh, the BCOB uh, system. We had a referral from uh, Strathcona Regional District actually bringing up that concern. So, um, and realizing that some of that issue and some of the sewage issue would also be sitting with Island Health and we also got some feedback from them. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, so on water, yeah, I guess um, there's still a few questions, but that was not my key concern. The, the noise, the next one is a big one. I think that we all realize that. On that one, I have some um, comments that are more substantive. Um, in, um, one of which is um, probably just staff will catch on to that, but I, there was this line that we will not um, revise our noise bylaw to kind of bring in, bring in raceways and auto racing. And, and there was a comment that raceways and auto racing were put alongside with um, highways, right? So that basically the noise bylaw did not apply to them. So one question I have is how many properties with these changes would have raceway potential in the Comox Valley, right? And the second is because if, if we actually don't, you know, if we don't put in the noise bother, we don't have a lot of recourse, um, it seems. And our noise bylaw does specify the, the kind of 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. and all those things. So I realized maybe there would have to be something else in our noise bylaw that's more appropriate to auto racing. But basically, I saw a gap there in terms of the policy as to how we would address it. I don't believe that leaving it with highways and auto racing together is the way to go. Um, some of my hope, and I, I had a brief discussion with that, was... Um, and this is where I will horrify many uh, racers in the community. In the community, but you know, I do that sometimes, just the way it goes. But you know, I think we will see a generational change in auto racing, um, unless we absolutely fail at the climate transition. Um, Dodge Ram just brought up their brought their electric uh, truck yesterday. Um, our bylaw officers are going to be in a Ford Lightning pretty soon, hundred percent EV. And um, and I and and when I think about that future, is how fast will we transition the petroleum fueled auto racing sector? The uh, the value of doing that long term is it will address the noise issue, <laughs> right? So when you look at the E series, it's pretty quiet. You hear the crowd. <laughs> you don't hear the vehicles. But then I was like, so it's it's a little bit my comment. The problem I have with just the 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 thing is that we don't have a lot of regulatory tools at the regional district. So even when you say we're we're going to have thirty four events, right? So say that something happens, and you know, 
um, the Leighton family decides that, you know, I don't know, they, they get this great package to move to Switzerland and <laughs> it looks great and they sell. Unless we're issuing, are we issuing permits for each event? I remember when the drag racing issue, we were, I don't believe we are because the zoning's in place. So what I'm saying is that when you bring arguments, we'll have 34 events. There's nothing that would prevent a future owner from having 365 events, right? And if you bring in the um, the go kart, right? You're starting to be a much more like rooted base and, and potential traffic. So, I, so as a decision maker, I have to think about the worst case scenario. So I can I can understand the intent and the goal, but as we all know, things change over time. Um, and it's the same. So then I was thinking, okay, well, creatively, I know this one won't work, but I was thinking if we don't bring the noise inside the noise bylaw, and I'll get back to that one. You know, could we say, could we put a requirement that 10% of events by 2025 are EV only? 30% of events by 2030 are EV only. 80% by 2040 is EV only. So then the community sees this huge reduction in noise over time, keeping in pace with what our societal goal around the transition is. So it would address noise. This one is likely not feasible, which is why I go back to, to the noise bylaw because it, which is, a, you know, it would take a, a different process than what we're suggesting here. But the other way to go about the noise issue would be to put in noise bylaw. And then in, in 2035, if we have the auto racing, we could say, okay, we're going to move the maximum decibel because I, I read the report and it looked like you were in the low 40s uh, decibel, right, for some of, of the events. So then we could, you know, change the bylaw at that time and say the maximum decibel level for auto racing is 30 or 25. And at that time, it would force the entire sector to move to electric car to prepare for that. I, it's just, it, it's just this. I think what we're deciding, you know, eventually around this proposal is we're really solidifying the future of the Saratoga Speedway. And, and it has, you know, it has a lot of consideration to this. I, I, I hear that Eric agree when he says, we're just looking at the campground, but I, I kind of, you know what I mean? Like even your map shows a comprehensive site, right? So it's good to create this divot. No, no, please, please listen to Dr. Amir one way or the other. Chair Amir. So, you know, I, I think of it comprehensive because it will be a comprehensive site. And, and I think that, um, so then I'll move to the other part. On the egg dev, I do acknowledge that this is, not and so I'll move from noise. I'm just leaving those comments room. On the egg dev, I do acknowledge Saratoga is within the settlement node, and um, this project has, would bring a lot of benefits um, from an economic uh, perspective. I think there's, um, there's a, a great culture and community around auto racing that has been part of Saratoga Black Creek for a long time. And I think it's it's a passion for many, and I think it's it's uh, positive for many people, even though there's concerns for many others. Um, the community amenity, I had some question around, which is um, the transit stop. And uh, at first, I was trying to wrap my mind around that one because our main interchange is actually on the other side of the Oyster River, right? So if I was going to put a park and ride. I'd put it at a place where people can get the Campbell River or head down or, you know, it's, so that was just a general geographic thing. But the other thing was, I don't, I don't think we can pretend that the goal here is to move people to go to the event by bus, right? Because on Sunday, we don't have any buses, <laughs> right? On Saturday, we have two. And on Friday night, the last bus is at 5.30. Right, so there's nobody that's going to use the bus to go to the events. So then I was thinking about the value of just the park and ride, and and I find there's a reference to it in the. Uh, am I going on too long? Kind of. <laughs> well, just, is, Madam Chair, as just I mentioned, uh, just the delegation is still at the table. This yeah. is the opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I am, I, I, and there will be lots of time for for uh, debate and discussion on the matter following. Just to not take too much of the delegation's time. I'm providing feedback, but I understand. Okay, so I'll, I'll wrap up. 
I wouldn't provide all these comments if I didn't think that the discussion in major and right with the applicants might actually eliminate our decision later. Um, yeah, no, I would have another 10 minutes for this. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll, I'll just jump. I'll follow our CEO's uh, recommendation to not dwell on it too much. Um, the canopy, uh, absolutely. That's also a noise mitigation, right? If you can build a campground with canopy, so I appreciate that. that that's the goal of the applicant. And the housing, it, again, it's that regulatory, right? You may end up on Hornby, what we do with some of those uh, six months term, like with vacation rental, is we act actually also put a, a, a time period of the year, right? So you can do it from May to October or something like that for that six months. Leaving that out, I think what you may end up with, and maybe not with the Latham family, but maybe in the future, is that that might become a great snowbird place, right? Where the races wrap up in October, and you got your Phoenix returning people, and you could probably fill the entire lot for the six months until racing starts again. So it could actually become a bit of a permanent community in the winter if you stick to the six months. Um, I had more, I'll leave it at that. Uh, my question my question is seeking a conversation, right? Because I think you've got a, a good application, there's good intent behind it. And for me, it's just raising the things that uh, arose out of the staff report and to try to determine uh, if there's appetite to go to public hearing, which obviously at that point, we would get a lot more feedback from the community, from everybody in a structured manner. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if uh, staff or if the applicant would like to respond. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I will comment on the uh, the park and ride transit stop uh, uh, through the chair. Yeah, you're you are correct. If the park and ride and the transit stop wouldn't facilitate people coming to an event at the through discussion with staff, through discussion with the Ministry of Transportation, there is a need for a adequate park and ride in that part of the world uh, because there will be a large parking lot associated with the uh, with the project because there will be uh, access directly onto the highway with the road dedication and the highway access. It was seen as this being a very uh, appropriate location for a parking red net area, and that's why we proposed it as a potential uh, as part of this project. It sounds like Director Arbor's got a follow up. Yeah, so now I have a question on that one. <laughs> so in the park and ride, did you have in mind like a dedicated number of spots or did you have it as mixed that on race days, those spots can be occupied by um, people who attend the races? Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you very much for the question. At this time, we were assuming that there'd be a, some dedicated number of spots along there, but on race days, if they were unoccupied, that they could be utilized. Like you said, race days are typically those weekends, very low uh, number of tra uh, transit routes run through there through the weekends. So. Thank you. Um, before I go to Director Grieve, I had a couple of questions myself. Um, regarding you know, the current uh, hookup for, for water with BCOB, is that primarily being used in your commercial area or how is the current hookup being used? I'm assuming it's metered, um, but I'm wondering if we've got a commercial water uh -huh. license at all. So um, I'll let you answer that first question. Go ahead. Yes, that's correct. The, uh, we have an existing two inch water service off of uh, Macaulay Road for the event venue. And uh, there's also a three quarter inch water service to the uh, residential lot along Highway 19A. Okay. And will those continue to be used at the same level? Or I'm just wondering what the impact of the, the, um, the campground expansion, do you see any increased need for water in those areas? No. So our intent would be to uh, stick with the event venue the way it is. And, you know, if our wells work out and produce what we hope to, there seems to be excess water there. Uh, we can certainly look at disconnecting the two inch water service and giving that back to the BCOB system to relieve a bit of flow. Okay, all right. Um, regarding the, the wells, um, and this is maybe also a question to staff around impact. Um, I, I'm, I'm reading from the staff report that, um, that our engineering staff are saying that the, the wells themselves will not impact BCOB water service. But um, A, I'm understanding there 
there probably is some kind of licensing, like a water sustainability act um, permit. Has that been um, has that been applied for, and or or are you waiting for this process to occur? Yes, that's correct. We're just waiting to get through the zoning process so the wells are all sitting there ready to go. Uh, but we didn't want to initiate. That's about a year long process, so we want to get through the zoning first, and then once we get there, then we would license the wells. Okay. So my my concern around that is, you know, we're we're the Water Sustainability Act. The the application is is fraught, I think, in in the agricultural sector specifically. Um, but my understanding is that once you have an application in place, it's basically a first in time, first in right, and um, you know, all of the other wells in the na the neighborhood, if they are not registered, and and we do start to see um, reductions in water availability, your rights are protected as a as an applicant, but the others that are not, um, may there may be some issues around um, ability. So, specifically to staff around the um, the impact to agricultural land are you aware of what what type of farming is happening across the road is it um i'm just hay or is there a livestock just wondering if, if it's an active farm at the at present no i'm not specifically aware of the type of farm okay because that type of activity you know i mean even if it was just hay right now uh, it may impact you know having having these wells may impact a what are water availabilities on the, the adjacent property if, if they're not able to get enough water, not knowing really how much water is in, in that area. Are staff aware of, of, do we have any aquifer mapping at all yes. in terms of, of um, availability, not just for this applicant, but just you know for the wider neighborhood and other activities? I, I'm not aware of it. something that our engineering department would be looking into. Though. Okay. Um, so yeah, water was my my big concern. The the impact that the um, the camping would have on uh, uptake of of groundwater, and the, the impact that would have not so much on BCOB but on you know the surrounding wells that that may or may not be in place. And you know, like Director Arbor, the second issue I just had was around the the noise. And you know, I think we we all agree that um, the Saratoga Speedway has been a part of the community for many, many decades and is, is loved by a certain por portion of the population that's not in doubt. And um, the, I think where the, the issue seems to be from hearing the delegation is just the unpredictability of, of when noise happens and the inability to predict when it's going to be quiet if, so that the residents can enjoy their own backyards in in peace and i'm thinking particularly on the weekends and that's not something that we as a regional district have the ability to enforce when um, businesses do you know do their business we don't have bylaws in regional district but um i i too was also kind of perturbed by the community amenity because it, it didn't seem to really be supporting this community you know, in, in Saratoga um, Speedway area. Whereas, you know, potentially a limitation like to, because I'm hearing scheduled, unscheduled events, potential um, uh, other times that are unpredicted when um, residents just don't know what, that they're going to have quiet, that may be actually a much bigger community benefit than even the park and ride, um, despite the fact that you know the park and ride is probably way more expensive to put in, but um, having having some quiet time is probably something would be much bigger community amenity. So that's just my kind of um, my thoughts on this. Um, are you? Is there an option for that? For the you know, as a proponent, you've got thirty four potential events happening. Um, would there be an ability to work with the community on those quiet days? I think we discussed this in length with staff and it became an inability to regulate it is the way I understood it. Um, perhaps you guys could comment on that, but we're, you know, our schedule is posted on our website, you know, practices every Thursday and, and track rentals that happen on other days of the week are 
you know, fairly hit and miss, right? It's, right. it's hard to predict that. Uh, we certainly have been respectful on Sundays. We learned that lesson pretty clearly the first time we ran on a Sunday. Uh, so we're trying to respect the churches of the area and not have that happen. So um, perhaps staff could comment on the regulation of that. I'm not 100% positive sure. how that would go. Okay, over to Jody. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, the community amenities have certain rules around them, what we can and cannot accept and, and those kind of things. Um, so like regulating a time of day or, or duration of events, uh, something we, we couldn't be able to do. We would be able to call a community amenity but it'd be something be, they could voluntarily agree to. Mm -hmm. uh, our ability to enforce, we'd have to review what that, what that would look like. Uh, any community amenities, they need to be expressly written down and presented at a public hearing so that when the board takes it and the public take a, takes a look at this, that they have the full picture of what's being proposed. So the community amenity is um, addressed at the same time as the proposal is. Um, uh, you can see what they propose as a community amenity currently based on their initial feedback is in their application to build a bus shelter and to have some an area for a park and ride to be placed. Staff is looking at the feasibility of park and ride there. Um, it, is a, it is on a bus route, uh, so a bus shelter would make sense there. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Director Grieve next and then Director Arbor. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. Yeah, I mean, obviously the uh, the issue around the, the noise is is the big uh, white elephant in the corner of the room over there, and our inability to uh, to manage that through through this uh, application. But, and I told Rob I was going to ask him this question. Um, can you see perhaps a possibility of uh, knocking off rentals on Sunday at four or five o'clock so people could, you know, uh, appreciate, you know, their own backyard and have some kind of a, a barbecue or whatever, at least uh, one day on the weekend? Because I do think that would go a long way to, uh, to garnering some community support. Uh, uh, I'm going to let the proponent... Please... Yes, absolutely. No, we're uh, we've got very few Sunday events scheduled. Uh, I believe there's a, a couple of long weekends with this Sunday event, but uh, yes, our intent would be to not run just basically ninety percent of the Sundays. There's no there's no event scheduled. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. And I do understand Director Arbor was going in a good direction there. I thought he was on a roll. Um, when you talk about you know the societal change going on and with with the environment and the fact that. You know, it's going to be a, a fair time before we have enough uh, jalopy Teslas out there to race around our track. Next time you want to crash it at $100,000 vehicle, let me know. But um, it's aiming in that direction. We're going in that direction. Uh, right now, we've got a, a, a bit of a cultural change, I think, with the racing community. Uh, I, I don't see us going to electric vehicles right away, but you mentioned, you know, uh, proper mufflering. And if, if, uh, if we can enforce that and do the other mitigation me measures, maybe we need another acoustic engineer to take a look at it when we get halfway there. But uh, you no, know, I, I see that uh, the whole noise issue is being, you know, something that has to be addressed basically voluntarily with the proponent because uh, we just lack the tools in our toolbox to control that. So I'm just throwing it out there. And now with uh, possibly being the only game on the island, uh, you're, you're going to have a, a little, a fair bit of clout with the racers to make sure that they they uh, they they do the right thing and, and put the right uh, muffling on their vehicles. Correct. Yes, absolutely, and they're all well aware of it. We've had meetings with all those groups, and uh, especially the crash guys. They're the guys that are kind of the worst offenders with pipes out the hood, etc. Uh, so they're all well aware. If they don't meet the 95 decibels at 100 feet, they're not going to run. Uh, so that's uh, that's been pretty clearly laid out. And as far as the transition, you know, years ago, we raced the cars in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And nowadays, it's cars in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So you're right, it eventually will transition to electric vehicles once those cars become more economical and disposable, essentially. And it may happen quicker than you think. Thanks. Director Arger. 
So earlier, I, I guess I was blamed for mostly talking, but maybe our CEO missed the question and our staff did as well, because I did ask the question in my comments to staff, whether they had given thought, we do have a regulatory tool for noise, it's our noise bylaw. So there is no recommendation to take auto racing, bring it, or, or raceway, raceways, raceways, we have a specific term. We have two different terms, I think, in your staff report. One is race race tracks or raceways, and the other is auto racing. But we can bring those into our noise bylaw and devise a regulation around that. And I also had a, another question at the time, which is how many other properties are affected and allow auto racing? Is this the only one, or are we going to... Do we have other properties that end up with the same zoning in the Comox Valley with these changes and we'll end up with five racetracks over time? I believe that we should look at bringing it into a noise bylaw because then rather than to ask uh, the owner you know, to self-regulate, you can have a clear framework based on a broad consensus. So you could actually say auto racing is not permitted from Monday to Wednesday. You know, You can devise all that in your noise bylaw. And to leave it open, along with highways, once, once the applicant moves to Switzerland, <laughs> just as an example, and we get somebody else that comes in and say, I'm going to do that 365 days. Right now, we don't have a process, right? So I'm just saying I would have liked to see a bit more thought because it is more than the elephant in the room. I think it's the key thing, right? The noise issue. Um, and, and we are talking, and I'm glad that we're not just talking about the campground. The campground will solidify the future of the site. That's what that will do. But once we do that, it's, it, I think it's an opportunity to really set a good tone to everything and, and have it, you know, have a backstop to it. So as staff considered, there was a line in your staff report that said, you know, we have not considered uh, a change to the noise bylaw. But my question then to staff is why not? Because we haven't been directed by the directors to do so, and uh, we're here to undertake the work that you you provide for us. Okay, answered your question. There was also the question around other properties. Are staff aware of any other properties um, that could potentially have um, this type of racing? Yeah, under the current zoning bylaw. Um, Auto racing is inside of outdoor recreation use, which is applied to many different like zones, including the tourist commercial zones, um, rural recreation zones. So there's a number of that. Under the draft bylaw here, the part of the proposal is to split out auto racing out of that outdoor recreation use and have it as its own use. So it would therefore only apply to this one here, this one property here and it would not therefore not be allowed in the other properties the, out, the where outdoor recreation use is allowed. Okay, that, that changes some things. Um, do directors have any other further comments or questions? Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to circle back to the water issue. I applaud the fact that uh, the proponent has those, I think they're 180 foot deep wells. So there, uh, we do have aquifer mapping. Um, because these two directors don't sit on the occupation base system, they weren't privy to some of the discussions we've had. Um, and yeah, the aquifer that uh, that's down by the riverbed that runs north is is separated from this aquifer, and also that um, the uh, the farms have a special uh, flat rate or, or like a, they're they're not the the lowest rate. So if you hook up your milk, milking power or whatever to the Black Creek Oyster Bay system, you get a special special rate. So uh, obviously there's probably shallow wells out there, but I think the hydrology report said that they're not affected by, by the deep wells. And I was thinking that if we could take some pressure off the oyster, uh, the Black Creek Oyster Bay system while we're looking for new water sources, that it would be definitely uh, uh, advantageous to the entire community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other co comments or questions. So on receipt of the um, of staff report. Just um, to ask the delegation to leave of the table. And then... Sorry, it's been a long time since we've had someone in person. So thank you, I'll, uh, I'll excuse you from the table. 
All right, then I will now ask for a receipt of the, the report. Uh, any comments or questions on, on receipt? All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And do we have any addendum to approve for this? No. I'll remove the recommendation then. There's a recommendation that's been moved uh, regarding giving first and second reading to bylaw 683 um, with the list of the properties that that would um, actually uh, refer to. Do we have a second? Second for the purpose of discussion. Okay, second by Director Arbor, and uh, sounds like discussion then. Um, Director Grieve, do you have a first comment? Well, I'm a bit of a, a eternal optimist in that I think there can always be compromise. I think that this session today has, has been the first step towards understanding each other and the situations. Obviously, you know, the two sides are quite far apart. And there's a lot of uh, emotion in the room. But I do think that by going to public hearing on this, we open up the gates even further for more comments from the community. And I think that's a very important way to go forward rather than, you know, work on, on, on this one meeting. And uh, there's obviously another, like I say, 1,100 and some odd petitioners that feel the opposite of, of the group that's with us right now. So we need to uh, we need to throw it out there and go through the entire process before we make up our minds. Thanks, Director Arbor. Thank you. So um, so um, in terms of process. Um, If this goes to public hearing, it would go as is. Is that correct? Or um, can the proponent propose modification or further consideration by staff? Or basically the package that we have there would go to public hearing. And, and maybe as a follow-up, just walk us through the full process. Once the public hearing is there, is there opportunity for revisions, et cetera, et cetera. Please tell us the framework we're dealing with where there is no flexibility and where there is some. Okay. Uh, so if you give first and second reading to the bylaw, then we proceed to public hearing. Um, this bylaw that was given first and second reading gets looked at at public hearing. And so there's no further revisions at that point. They can include uh, revisions to the community many contributions. They can, that gets put forward to the public hearing as well. Um, Public hearing has public notification. We mail notices to all the surrounding land use, our surrounding owners, uh, published in the paper. Uh, any correspondences received uh, from here on uh, gets directed to the directors. So they have, uh, and documented. So we have hard copies of all the correspondences that are written. Um, and they all get considered at the public hearing stage. After public hearing, no further revisions are allowed. No further input is allowed. If, if there is, if the directors would like to see revisions after public hearing to the bylaw based on what they heard at the public hearing, then we have to go back and either likely rescind and re-give first and second reading and redo public hearing. Um, so it'd be revision, then redo public hearing, and then see if that, how that lands. Right, thanks. And Director Arbor's got a follow-up. And I guess one of the, the things that was missing that I, I think we would see at the public hearing level is there was the notion that we received 300 comments, right? But we, at public hearing, we would see usually staff would comment 210 were in favor and 90 were not. Like, I, I didn't see a lot of uh, commentary around you said they were both in favor and against, but we didn't see a split. We didn't see the letters either. I wonder if those 300 let letters or emails that were sent would actually be brought into the public hearing or would people have to resubmit those? And I'll have a couple more questions after this one. Yeah, it's my understanding that you, the, everything that was submitted from here on after the first second reading is given the public hearing as a result of our public notification gets 
put to the public hearing. So you get correspond, you receive those word correspondences. To date, the correspondences we received were not solicited. We didn't go out and seeking that public comment. It was just people, the citizens paying attention to the meetings yes. that heard about it and, and uh, provided those comments. Those are very useful for our preparation of the bylaws so we can address, if we know what's of concern and we can preemptively address those items. But, um, if yeah. I mean, but they would be in, brought into the package. Those received to date, would they be brought as part? Because because I've seen two hundred of them, but I haven't seen three hundred. You know, like we got a lot of correspondence over the last few months on this. And what I'm trying to say is, would we have a comprehensive view of everything that's come in, or would we ask residents to resubmit their letters if they want to be part of a public hearing through the uh, through the CO2, um, Madam Chair and the directors? Uh, that's a great question. In regards to all our correspondence that we received um, at, at the initial stage of the report to now. Those comments are part of the file, of the working file, and it's, it's, it's documented in, in our file. In regards to new comments, I would encourage the public to provide comments at the public hearing meeting. Um, the file itself, the working file, it will be um, available at, at our staff counter to view, but also the documents will be also available on our website. And my last question in regards to um, amendments to the noise bylaw, this I assume could be an entirely separate process that is not contingent on this application, but as our CAO said, if directors so wish to initiate a process like that, we could outside of this application, is that correct? Through Madam Chair to Director Arbor. So regards to the noise bylaw, staff has been, applying staff has been working closely with bylaw compliance. Uh, regards to uh, the noise bylaw. And it's our understanding and our, our interpretation that uh, the noise bylaw does not capture the noise coming from the, the speedway. It, it captures noises from um, some vehicles, but not with regards to their, their event itself. Um, if the board choose to um, direct staff to review their noise bylaw, that's something that staff can look into and report back to you at a later date. Thank you, Mary. Thanks. And Director Grieve, did you have a question? I thought I saw your light on. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, yeah, I would, I would uh, definitely recommend putting this forward. Um, we have had uh, public hearings before where we, uh, we went back and rescinded the, uh, the bylaw and then adapted it and came back again. And yes, we had another public hearing. So whether or not, um, you know, that's, that's the way to go. Um, I'm thinking this is a, a broader discussion and, and, and a deeper discussion than I think a lot of people anticipated. Um, I do believe that what has to be borne in mind though, if we fail to act at all, that the raceway will continue on regardless and with even less communication with the CVRD. So I'm thinking better to take everybody into the tent. That's a, that's a, a camping joke, folks. And, uh, and, and get, uh, at, at least, at least get it going forward. I, I do believe that, um, there's opportunity here to, uh, for compromise. The, 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 um, proponent has expressed the fact that he wants to use uh, the California uh, Racing Association best practice at 95 dB at 100 feet. Maybe as time goes by, we, we can even work on that. I, I think the noise issue is a big one, but it's not being addressed by, by a campground zoning. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Uh, and I'll make one comment too before we, we go to vote. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, I was glad. I'm glad to see the the proposal by the proponent, and I see many um, issues that were addressed around fires and around berming. Um, so I really want to thank the proponent for taking those, um, you know, those concerns and and uh, working with them. 
Um, I still feel, however, that the local community is bearing a large brunt of the repercussions around noise, particularly. I also I particularly have a water concern for the future. And, um, you know, to Director Greaves' comment, uh, yes, we could go to uh, public hearing and then resend and then come back. I don't think actually that's the best course for the proponent. I think that would actually take a much longer time. Rather have the, the proponent come back with a, a different offer that speaks to the noise issue. Um, you know, I, I, I recognize that this is a camping um, zoning uh, amendment, but as Director Arbor mentioned, this really is a whole site plan and we can't ignore the, 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 the noise issue and that this really does solidify the activities as currently, um, you know, being, uh, being put forward, that it kind of, it, it really does um, in a way allow the, the activities. And I think from hearing from the community, um, the level of activity and, and the impact of the activity uh, needs some change and needs some mitigation. So those are my comments and uh, yeah, I will leave it to there. I don't see any other lights on, okay. I will call the question on the vote then um, for first and second reading of the bylaw. All in favor? Opposed? No. Oh, sorry. Was that a comment or? Favor. In favor? Two in favor? Myself opposed? So then that, that is carried. And uh, we will, um, do we do a comment or staff will come back around when public hearing is? Okay, all right, so thank you. Thanks for everybody um, for coming forward. We have, do we want to move on or do you want to break for lunch? Or do, no, we have a lunch. We have our own lunch today, yes. Okay, yes, a working lunch. So why don't we come back in, in 10 minutes with, with lunch included? Okay, thank you.
Maybe stop at one thirty and we'll do that live. Okay. All right. Are folks okay to? Yeah, so we should be okay. To work, work and lunch. Yeah. Okay. I'll call the meeting back to order. Um, we are on item number five, the Commonwealth Valley Emergency Program, Function Two Seven One for receipt. How are you there? I am Russell. I um, can't get access to my video. But uh, we've got your voice, and um, and Lisa, do you have his presentation? Yep, we'll get it up for you here in a moment, Howie. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, through the chair, uh, or through the CEO to the Madam Chair and the uh, directors, uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to present my emergency program electoral area services budget function 271. Uh, Lisa, can you go to the second next slide please? So a little bit of background on the service and function overview. Um, we do only have one establishment bylaw. Uh, that's bylaw 1341, which is established for the electoral services area. Uh, and the purpose of that is to serve the rural uh, residents of the electoral area A, B, and C uh, to provide emergency planning and coordination uh, and assisting in preparedness and for response to emergencies, as well as um, for business continuity to support proactive planning uh, to ensure critical services for the CVRD and vital regional services is delivered uh, for the best potential for operating uh, during disruptions or emergency. Next slide, please. So just wanted to highlight a, a few of our work plan priorities. Um, you also see these attached to the uh, Penis, uh, Penis B uh, or A in the back. Um, so Part of our work plan this year will be a, a community resilient investment grant uh, to continue funding fire smart public education and prevention initiatives. And we are waiting just on the official word of that process. And this, this uh, initiative for fire smart does take this grant to keep it sustainable and ongoing. We will continue working in collaboration and under the guidance of our terms of reference, which is in, in draft right now and with Ministry of Transport uh, and with in conjunction with Macaulay Road Neighborhood Area Associates, Mariah, to do a study and town hall sessions for determining potential evacuation routes uh, considered uh, for using in the uh, OCP, the official community plan or regional growth strategies. Uh, in my budget is for only for staff time as the funding will be coming through electric areas C feasibility studies uh, service. Um, more direct support to Hornby Island and Denman Island emergency programs and, and Mariah, as well as other electoral area groups that may uh, come out of our NEP uh, work that we do. And as well as a soft launch of a revised neighborhood emergency preparedness program and its materials uh, and delivery mode. And all and every time we always are looking at being prepared for response readiness. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this slide here is, an, is a comparison uh, for, uh, for uh, 2021 and 2022. So just going to highlight some of the key pieces of this. The overall proposed budget for 2022 total is 147, a decrease of 134,727 from 2021. The decrease is mainly a result of grant applications to the Community Resilient Investment um, Fund uh, up to 99,000 not confirmed this time. Uh, we are still waiting on the official word. The proposed 2022 tax requisition is uh, 127,000, an increase of 5,608 or 14 or 4.6 percent increase from 2021. In order to maintain current service levels in both functions 271 and, and 270, which again share one uh, establishment bylaw, uh, an increase in 2021 of 25% was done and approved. Uh, this resulted in a new maximum levy of, of 0 0.03 per thousand of a tax, uh, taxable assessments, which is resulting in a maximum requisition available in 2022 of 313,440. 
for supporting both functions. Some of those costs were personnel for 2022 are projected for 100,782, 100, an increase uh, by 3,050 over 2021. From a review of the emergency program coordinator or EPC position and the deputy EPC's positions, organizational projects and tasks, it was determined a redefining of the positions were required. The original EPC title shifted to the emergency uh, manager, the manager of emergency programs. The deputy EPC has now been shifted to emergency planning coordinator uh, with this the new hire. This was done to enhance the program's ability to be more strategic in emergency management planning and to be better aligned with potential changes that may come out of the provincial modernization of emergency management legislation. Operation costs for 2022 are proposed at 26,106, a decrease of 150,889 from 2021. This is mainly due to not having received official word again from the Community Resilient Investment Grant at that time, which we did uh, achieve over uh, 90,000 last time for, as well as less transfer reserves used this year. Reserve contributions of 13,112 are budgeted in 2022 with an annual contribution plan for 2023 to 2026, uh, averaging at 16,695 each. And this is to fund uh, our emergency vehicle as well as replace some of the uh, projections for replacement of, of key equipment like our generators located throughout the CVRD. Uh, capital recovery funds are for uh, are for uh, 20, uh, 270 contributions for the replacement of the original emergency program um, vehicle, uh, which is EM 2271, which is proposed to replace at 2026. So next slide, please. I'm not going to go into the great detail, just that we do are as a core service, we do look at the board uh, drivers, the strategic drivers and regional growth strategies um, as one of our, our key focuses on our work plan. So some of the uh, items that we will be looking at in our, which latch really closely to the board's drivers is support establishing an assessment management program for the service, increased focus on the four pillars of emergency management with a special attention to mitigation, uh, risk reduction, harm reduction, uh, from extreme weather events. Continue working collaboratively with Hornby Island, Denman Island Emergency Preparedness Communities and MARA, the Macaulay Road Area Neighborhood Association. Continue working closely with KFN, Comox First Nations, on their Community Wildfire Protection Plan and Joint Preparedness Planning. Um, work in these areas will continue to need integration of advanced planning on all of society, whole of government, community recovery, and resilient lens in alignment with the new Emergency Program Act legislations and the changes that may be coming from that. Next slide, please. So just um, some of the highlights we, on our last slide here is, is the cost per, per household on a 6,000 um, 6, home is uh, for 2022 is $6.72 compared to last year, which is a, based on a $500,000 home at that in that year at $7.30. Uh, the tax requisition for 2022 uh, will be 0 0.0112 per thousand uh, of sets value. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Howie. <clears throat> Do directors have any questions? I have, oh, go ahead, Director Grief. Put my mask on so nobody knows who I am after that last one. <laughs> um, just hoping, Howie, that uh, you don't have anything to do this year. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, I mean, it's all, it's all about that, you know, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, you just can't look in a crystal wall and see what's coming around the bend. And we've seen uh, a lot of things come around the bend that we never expected. So, you know, I think it's important that uh, we stress the fact that we're talking about, what is it, like 11 cents? No, yeah, 0 0.011. So there's absolutely nothing. One, one cent, is that what that is? 1.12 cents? I mean, it's virtually nothing considering the the uh, the demands we make on on the service 
when we need to. And let's just hope we don't need to this year. Just give everybody a break. Thanks, Dr. Grieve. Um, Howie, your, um, the grant application that did go forward for the um, wildfire, like the resilience, can you um, remind us where, what projects were being put forward, like in what geographical areas, what communities was, was that going to target? Uh, to the to the chair, yes. Um, that grant supports a regional approach to fire smarting. So uh, the fire chiefs have taken a lot of the funding and going out and working with uh, within their fire departments in their areas, uh, and working very closely with uh, uh, Comox First Nations to look at um, delivering those initiatives. Some of those initiatives are the chipping program that they they have uh, going on um, on Hornby, Denman, and and um, in other areas is the community. Um, the, the key piece of that is with the, without that funding, those, those, that, uh, that chipping program, um, which is, is a key piece in reducing the fire risk in communities is getting that extra fuel away from the homes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wouldn't, it's not sustainable without that, without that grant. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm looking forward to hearing that announcement when we, when we do hear it. Um, Director Grief, you know, brought up the, this idea of hoping that your services aren't having to be used. Um, however, I think we, we realize uh, that these extreme events that we've been having happening over 2021 with both heat and cold are going to be coming more and more frequent. You know, I, I note that your staff were involved in the extreme cold um, shelter that, that, or the warming center that had to be opened. Um, a lot of the impacts of um, extreme events do happen in the municipalities. And I know we support the municipalities through your, your providing US staff. Is that under this function or is there a separate function that happens for, for the, the times and when staff have to be, you know, coordinating more regional things? Yeah, Madam Chair, um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer some of this and then if Kevin or Doug want to jump in, I feel free. Uh, so in our 270 budget, we do focus more at the regional component, not just electoral areas. Um, and a part of that initiative, there is a project on it with, the, with the new hire, the emergency planning coordinator, uh, that she will be working with working groups within the community uh, based on what we've actually made more, you know, stronger connections with through the extreme weather event that we just had with the cold um, to build on um, looking at what, what's defining first, you know, how, is that weather events in the future defined as emergencies and then what is uh, defined as uh, gaps in service delivery supporting those in the community. So that's part of that project and that'll be, it's already started, Carrie's uh, working at that right now and making those connections, but that's how it's in 270 and I'll do a little bit more of that uh, update uh, tomorrow at our 270 uh, okay. presentation to you. All right, I'll hold my questions then for, for tomorrow. Then um, specific to er the electoral areas, um, do we still have capacity to do the neighborhood em emergency planning projects that we were hoping would happen like on a neighborhood level? Uh, our, our just to the, to the chair, um, are you indicating like the NEP program directly or just initiatives? Um, either way, like okay. Okay. whatever sort of neighborhood level programs that we were hoping to get started. So, so yeah, so part of the, um, uh, and this is our kind of how our, our program is a little bit broken when it comes to staffing, is that some of the wages that we have are covered under the electoral areas, this, this budget, and some of the percentage of the wages come out of 270. So for it's hard to split a staff person into 20%. So what we try to do is Carrie is going to be leading the NEP program, the, the, the Neighborhood Emergency Program Initiative, and we're doing mm -hmm. a soft launch for this, this year, um, because of the materials that have changed, um, we want to really get the, uh, a better feel from those uh, communities that have already been established and had input in that, that material to really get a feel for it. And then we're approaching a couple of other communities that have shown interest as a pilot communities to test the material 
because they want to move their neighborhood into a more focused level. Um, part of the, also part of the initiatives are is Kerry uh, will be sitting um, on some of the emergency preparedness committees like Hornby and Denver particularly because they were looking at in our priority list of doing some more exercises and preparedness planning. So she'll sit on those committees to be a liaison from the emergency program to see how we can better support them uh, in those initiatives. Okay, thank you. Um, great work that you've done this last year. I, I know there's a was a ton of overtime that went in. So thanks. Thanks for everything. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions on the table. So on receipt then is all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried unanimously. We have a recommendation that uh, the financial plan for function 271 be approved. Comments, questions? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, and that's carried unanimously. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And item next item up is function 556, the Denman Island Economic Development Function and Hornby, and Hornby Island 555, sorry. For receipt, moved and seconded, and over to staff. Doug DeMarzo will provide this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you. And through the chair to directors, this is regarding the island's economic development services, 555 and 556. I will present them both in one presentation here and open it up for questions. I think as we move forward uh, with the next slide, we can recognize that both Denman and Hornby offer this service through distinct groups. So in the case of Hornby, it's the Hornby Island Community Economic Enhancement Corporation, also referred to as High Seat commonly, and on Denman, it's Denman Works. So for a property assessed at about 600,000, the tax impact would be about $55 for Hornby and $45 for Denman. It's important to note that this meets many of the board strategic priorities, again, with fiscal accountability, with reaching this money out into the community, both groups uh, help to do that, as well as the partnerships that are maintained by each of the groups. Uh, Denman more so from a community granting process and High Seek more so from reaching out and networking opportunities as well as delivering on their thematic themes outlined in their strategic plan. On to the next slide. So looking at this budget here, you will notice that um, HiSeq will be looking at operating grant requests from 2022 of about 88,000 and Denman Works of about 50,000. It should be noted that uh, HiSeq in their five-year plan will be moving up to about 107,152 by 2026 in their proposed plan where Denman uh, increases to 58,000 by the end of the financial year. Both uh, HiSeq and Denman will continue on supporting economic development on their islands, and Denman or HiSeq is continuing to do this through their economic development action plan. One thing of note here is the surplus is carried forward, and that was largely a surplus on Hornby from the 2019 bus conversations that were had there and are now housed more in the transit budgets. I think with that, um, it's more or less status quo for these two services moving forward with the exception of uh, potential operating increases as outlined earlier. So I'll leave it open to any questions you may have. Interesting questions, Dr. Um, Thank you. And I, I think both of those organizations were pretty instrumental in the past year. And helping secure the next item on the agenda, which is the internet, uh, the high-speed project. So that was a great achievement. Um, in terms of um, Denman, um, do you, Doug, do, you, do we have uh, any process to kind of compare the grants they're making in relative to our grant and aid that we make on Denman? I don't think we've synergized that or built a process around that, have we? I'm just realizing uh, it this year. 
Yeah, there's no built-in process. Kevin and I do review all the grants to make sure they fall within more or less the parameters of meeting Denman Works mandate, and as well as ensuring the CBRD is not duplicating. And, you know, also the third component Kevin and I look at is making sure it's within the responsibility or not in the responsibility of the provincial or federal governments. Um, Kevin, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, certainly through the chair to Director Arbor. So yeah, I just want to concur with, with what Doug indicated. I mean, it's not anything formalized, but certainly when we review the submissions from Denman Works, uh, we obviously do uh, take into account that obviously we have, you know, kind of the grant and aid service as well. And so we will always make sure that is it better aligned perhaps in that service than here. And also, again, you know, to make sure that uh, we're not either duplicating or or you know, taking the place of, of more suitable uh, uh, funding sources. Thanks, and one last question. Um, I did note for tomorrow's agenda, buried in the, uh, uh, in the transit uh, discussion budget is a mention that maybe we will look at opportunities to uh, look at those services from a BC transit optic. Um, is it fair to say that those are not in the the contract, anyways, on Hornby is not in the ninety thousand. It's supplemental, is it? Uh, through the chair to Director Arbor. So no, we do, as you will see in the transit budget presentation tomorrow. So I certainly don't want to usurp uh, Mike Zabarski in his presentation. Yeah. But certainly yeah. we have built uh, some additional uh, supports to both Demon and Hornby Islands for their community bus initiative. So that's where actually those contributions will now be sitting. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Director Ever. Um, Doug, just a question more high level. You know, I, I always note the difference between Dunman and Hornby, in, especially in, in regards to economic development, two really different models. And I, want, I wonder if there's been conversation on Denman about moving to the, the Hornby model. I mean, they seem to, Hornby seems to just be able to leverage so much more and get so much more done, but um, has that conversation ever happened? Like, do they realize that, you know, Denman or Hornby gets almost double what they're getting? Well, I think there's a couple of conversations. I think most recently it was this August, Kevin and I, as well as Lisa went over to uh, meet with the Denman folks to understand Denman works and what they were hoping to propose in their budget. And at that time we did discuss uh, the strategic planning component that you see strongly in, with HiSeq, which helps guide their actions. And I think, um, although there was interest, I'm not sure there was uh, full capacity at this point, and we kind of left them with that conversation to come back to us, it, either through the budget process or reopen it next year. Um, you know, they've really moved towards even more so this year, their community on Denman, their community grant projects uh, are typically around 16,000 this year, they're proposing 20,000 out of that budget. So if anything, they're moving even further away from the administrative grant coordination, well, I shouldn't say grant, Denman Works coordination piece of utilizing that portion of the budget as where, um, as you've alluded to in the high seek model, they tend to be strategic plan focused and also look to uh, bring more money in and utilize our funding to attract other funding as well. So the conversation was had this, this August, I think, if I correct, or September, whenever. And um, that's kind of where it's sitting. They have their own model and we're there to assist them if need be. And we've also indicated that on Denman, you know, if they do need increased funding, whether it's for one or two years to develop that strategic plan or not, that's a conversation and CBRD staff is open to. Okay, great. Glad to hear those conversations are, are happening. No more questions from me or the other directors. So on receipt then, all in favor? Opposed, that's carried. And recommendation for function 555. Um, financial plan has been moved and seconded. Any other comments? Hearing none, all in favor? And that's approved five, unanimously. Five, 556 five, has been moved and seconded. Comments? All in favor? And that's unanimous. Report. All right, next item is the Denman and Hornby Island High Speed Internet Contribution Function uh, 560 has been moved. 
and we'll second it and over to staff. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Russell has had to step out, so I will introduce myself to introduce this staff. Uh, so as you're all very familiar with, I'm sure the referendum was held in the fall to ask the uh, public around supporting a new Denman and Hornby, Denman and Hornby Islands High-Speed Internet Contribution Service that uh, referendum uh, achieved elector support. And so this is the inaugural budget of the, uh, of the service. The, uh, the service is to contribute the capital funds for high-speed internet service to the islands and to use revenue earned under an agreement uh, with the recipient of that capital financing to provide grants and other forms of assistance that would benefit residents and community organizations in the service area. The CDRD will enter into a contribution agreement with City West and City West will construct, own, and operate the high-speed internet infrastructure on the islands. In 2022, the requisition is just, just over $92,000, and that would be the equivalent of, of the annual contribution towards the debt servicing. Um, if the contribution is not required in 2022, then we would look to put that money into a reserve fund and <laughs> begin those payments in 2023. The residential tax, estimated residential tax for this year is, uh, is the equivalent of $33 for a home that's assessed at $600,000. Um, City West is working with its construction contractors to determine the timelines for installation and eventually, eventually offering the service to the islands. And they are in contact with not only the residents, but the uh, High Seek and Denman Works representatives, part of the internet committee on the islands. And so if there's any questions that you have, happy to, happy to answer. Thanks. I don't see any questions. Great report. On receipt then, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. We have a recommendation. Oh, Moved and seconded that the financial plan for function 560 be approved and the CVRD direct staff to bring forward a bylaw to establish in 2022 a future expenditure reserve for the Denman Hornby Island High Speed Internet Contribution Service function 560. Any other comments? Bring in seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. And the next item is the Arts and Cultural Grant Service 615 for receipt. Moved and seconded. And over to staff. Thanks, Madam Chair. And uh, sorry, Kevin and Doug, I'm not sure who's going to be presenting this report. I can present this one, and Kevin can assist me where need be. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Kevin will be the next one. Thank you. Um, through the chair, uh, to the directors, this is your electoral arts and culture function. The purpose of this is really to assist with the protection and preservation and maintenance and promotion of infrastructure. Most of this infrastructure res resides in the municipalities. Um, the impact of the electoral areas is $6.84 for a residence assessed at $600,000. Um, again, we look at your board's strategic priorities, and, and like many of our uh, nonprofit shared priorities, there is some fiscal responsibility here is shared by the electoral area residents for their participation in what the services are provided by the arts and culture uh, functions within the municipalities. Furthermore, <clears throat> from a community partnerships perspective, it's really about the CVRD electoral area supporting those organizations and nonprofits and um, they develop those partnership opportunities with us and look at how they can deliver their uh, outputs and programs to the region in general. I think as you go through the budgets, you'll notice, well, 2022, we're still not fully open as this COVID does have a larger impact on some of these service providers and revenue streams than some of our more core service things like engineering, as you're well aware. Uh, they have continued for virtual off offerings. You may recall briefly last year, there was some discussion around the farmer's market and whether this was the right home for it. Um, for now, the farmer's market remains in this budget. And, um, that's just one of the, the pieces where it's difficult to find where, where it fits cleanly, I guess, for lack of a better word. I think the biggest change you'll see here is a move away from a regional arts and culture strategy that has been discussed in the past. Instead, Cumberland and Courtney are both undertaking their own studies, which may come back and inform a regional strategy. 
And as such, uh, Courtney has requested 15,000 to be included in this budget and is included. And you'll notice in your options section, there's a number of scenarios there. Secondly, the Comox Valley Arts Council is looking for quite substantial increases over the next few years. Uh, not so much this year, but moving forward. And again, the, the uh, recommendation speaks to perhaps the Arts Council's invited as a delegation to gain a better understanding of these operational increases, especially in advance of the Cumberland and Courtney uh, studies not being quite completed yet. So we don't really know what, what those are gonna say in the future. So that's one of the recommendations in front of you. And again, there's a number of options that you can consider as you uh, ask questions or think about how this budget moves forward. Moving on to the next slide, um, just list the grants that are given out in comparison to 2021. And here you'll see a, a slight increase of tax requisition of about 10,000. And then the uh, 15,000 I alluded to earlier for the Courtney study was really a, a carryover piece. Um, so the 10,000 increases are largely due uh, to operating expenses with with some of the bigger facilities, including the Sid Williams. And our modest increase is proposed throughout the years. Onto the next slide. We're basically working to continue to support the fixed costs with reductions in revenues. And again, this, this budget's pretty status quo, uh, aside from the things that I've spoken to on how we deliver this service. So at that time, I will uh, open it up for any questions. Thanks. Directors have questions? Director Degree? Just one. Um, how much money do we get from the municipality to support art and culture in the regional district or the rural areas? Is that a rhetorical question or <laughs> an actual? I withdraw that. Okay. I think we know the answer. That's, no, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, just, it just, I think this is important to uh, impress upon our uh, municipal partners when, uh, when certain requests come up. Um, you know, I think I'm, my mind goes to the, uh, the amount in sports, uh, which is what, function five? 45 or 600 is rec grant. Yeah, so, yeah, so it just, it just really to remind them that we do contribute a lot of money to, uh, projects and uh, facilities and programs in the municipality. So sometimes it's good to reciprocate. Thank you. Thanks, Director Grieve. Um, I had a question, Doug, around the, the Arts Council um, request. If, if they do come forward as a delegation and if the board was to approve the delegation or the request in this year, do we have um, reserves? Uh, where would that funding or could that funding be um, applied for or requested in 2022? Yeah, I don't think the request is very large for 2022. I think they might have sought 7,000, but I'll have to double check. Maybe Kevin can answer that, but I think it's more for the future years of 2023 and onwards where we really see the substantial increases. So that'll give us time to work with them based on their delegation and any instruction by EASC to determine what the best path forward is for future years. Maybe I'll just pass this one over to Kevin just to answer about directly about this year. Uh, certainly through the uh, chair to uh, Chair Hermir. So yes, we do have a modest reserve that we're currently maintaining for this service. Um, coming out of 2020, we had about 25,000 in that reserve. We did supplement that with about another 15 last year. Um, so we have about $40,000 this year kind of, and, and again, that's partly just to kind of deal with some of the, you know, kind of uh, varying degrees of these um, asks. Um, so, you know, a, we could potentially deal with something this year, but as Doug alluded to, we're not expecting there's going to be much by the way of a significant increase this year. It's more about planning for the future. Thank you for that. And I do agree actually that, that the farmer's market is very much part of the culture of the Comox Valley. I, mean, I think it does, it does make sense. I know the other projects tend to be hard um, bricks and mortar uh, type facilities, but um, the market does provide quite a, a benefit that cultural lies to the community. Any other comments from the directors? Uh, Director Grieva, uh, go ahead. 
Just one. It's. Um, I'm just wondering if we heard any murmurings uh, from Music Fest uh, this year about uh, looking for funding from the electoral areas. I don't. I think that at one time we talked about them maybe making an application to the Arts and Culture Grant to be be considered part of it, but nothing has come in this year. Um, not to date that we've seen. I do. I should have noted that the Electoral Arts and Culture Grant does have a little bit of room for events, mostly directed to rural areas. Um, so there is opportunity for for any group to still uh, look at gaining some funding, and, and that would sort of come through the grant and aid process or be approved through. You know, as we receive all those grants, we find out where their best fit is. So. Yeah, yeah, it's good. We still have the grant and aid to catch all the other pieces. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Director Reeve. No other questions? So then on receipt, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we have a recommendation. Moved, Moved and seconded to approve the, the financial plan for the Arts and Culture Grant Function 615 and to engage with the Comox Valley Community Arts Council to encourage them to appear as a delegation. Any comments on that? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's unanimous. And I think we might be able to squeeze the last one in. So the comfort stations, function 686 for receipt. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Or is that to you, Kevin? Uh, yes, Chair, it is. Just gonna bring up my screen. <laughs> So really briefly, just adding cleanup here on budgets for today, um, just here to present quickly the comfort station budget for uh, function 686. There we go. Oops. So yes, um, as directors may be aware, this service was anticipated to be wound down uh, uh, over the course of this year, 2022. Um, and uh, the ongoing work plan has already been transferred over to the Electoral Areas, Parks and Greenway Service Function uh, 621. However, we do have two outdoor washroom facility projects that we committed to in 2021 that have had to be carried forward into 2022. So while there is no requisition once again being proposed for the service, there is some remaining work to be done and that work will continue to be funded by the remaining reserves that uh, are still in place for the service. And once that work is completed, Completed over the course of this year, we would then anticipate that the service would finally be fully wound down and the service establishment repealed in uh, 2023. So very quickly, you can see here that, uh, again, we did draw down the reserves fairly substantially because uh, we did have some of those outdoor washroom projects go ahead last year. Uh, so we are carrying forward about $30,000 in remaining work. And then, as I said, we are fully anticipating over the next little while that uh, all of that work will com be completed and that uh, the service will ultimately be um, wound down and repealed as, as anticipated. And that's all I really have, certainly open to any questions. I didn't see any of the questions from the directors. There's good comfort in the comfort station service. Okay. So thank you for that. Um, all, I guess, on receipt then. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. And we have recommendation. Moved and seconded that function 686 financial plan be approved. Any comments? I mean, seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. And do we have any new business? And Director Grieve. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for this opportunity. Um, we just uh, received a delegation today from uh, concerned citizens up in Saratoga Beach area um, regarding the, uh, the racetrack. And the rezoning actually of the, the campsite was more the, the issue of the day, but uh, we heard quite loud and clear that it was way too loud and way too clear out there. So uh, there was some, some discussion um, around the fact that uh, we don't have the tools to control um, the, the noise level at the speedway. And seeing as though that the main concern obviously was the noise, and not so much the campsite or the, or the rest of the, the water issues and what have you. I would like to uh, propose a motion to direct staff to bring a report forward on uh, 
on revising a new noise bylaw for the electoral areas of the Comox Valley Regional District. Thank you. Great. And that's a motion to move forward. Is there a second? I can second it, so put it on the table. Yep. Yeah. And Director Arbor. Do you want to say that into the mic, Director Arbor? Sorry. Uh, the way I, I read it is you intended to say for auto racing to look at an amendment for auto racing in the noise bylaw or just the noise bylaw in general? I, I think that, that it was explained by staff that it would have to be all pretty well comprehensive. But to include the auto racing, which is it would include auto racing and any other other things that don't fall inside the bylaw at the present time. So it'd be, it would have to include some kind of review. Okay. Sorry, James. Thanks. I think I think that um, staff could certainly take a look at the bylaw and, and the current regulations that apply and what opportunities we do have. I know that we've we've conducted a review of the noise bylaw, and I don't know how many years ago, but it wasn't too too many years ago. Last year, maybe. So we can certainly re, re, we can look at that, and we can engage with bylaw compliance, and bring back a report that speaks to the the parameters of that of that regulation. And if there's opportunities to revise, we can take a look at, at the... Uh, yeah, the because you do, I mean, there, there is situations like the the uh, the uh, fishing game club where they have the boom town and everything. You can hear the, the gunshots going off across the lake. So I don't know if that would catch that as well. Obviously, they got their own, their own little uh, special zone up there. But certainly, I think it's important for the residents to realize that with their present tools, we cannot regulate... The, the noise level of the racetrack. And that seemed to be the primary issue uh, at today's uh, uh, presentation. So, yeah. So we can just open up that bylaw and then see what we can do to uh, to regulate, uh, especially related to the uh, the speedway. Thanks, Director Reeve. Um, Lisa, do you mind just posting the, like what you have down for the actual uh, motion? Um, because I too, like uh, similar to I think comments that Director Arbor made, I actually would like to limit it to to um, auto racing just so that it doesn't take up so much of staff's time. But maybe do other do the directors have other comments on on broadening it beyond auto racing? Well, just just leave guitar amplifiers out of the mix, will you? Thanks. So the motion is to direct staff to bring a report on revising the noise bylaw. Specific to the motion, I would add uh, to bring a report on revising the noise bylaw in regards to auto racing. And if you don't want that amendment, I'll probably vote it against. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I would second that amendment. And are there comments or questions on the amendment? Okay, shall we vote on that amendment then? Uh, well, regards to auto racing and its impact on on uh, the adjacent neighborhood, do we want to enlarge it at all? I mean, is there other things we, we get uh, large parties? Uh, obviously, things like music fests are kind of exempt, and they take place in the city of Courtney by by the rights. So, okay, uh, yeah, direct staff to bring a report because it's only a report so we can get the information uh, on, on reviving the noise bylaw amendment uh, as it pertains to auto racing. Yeah, I think so. And other, other community events, or do you want to include community events at all? For, I, I wasn't considering that, so. Okay. Yeah. If that's what we can get with, you know, we can go behind that. Okay, so we'll just vote on the amendment then, um, with the that inclusion of that clause. No, I'll accept as a friendly. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah. No, just the auto racing period. So then uh, the motion is to direct staff to bring a report on revising the noise bylaw as it pertains to auto racing. Yeah. Or, That's broad enough. It's yeah. just a report. Yeah. Okay. So we'll vote on that. All in favor? Oh, sorry, James. Thank you. Thanks, directors. No, just to just to say that I, I don't know exactly when we'll be able to get this report back to you. Yep. Uh, we'll take a look at our work plan, and it, uh, it it may not be returned immediately. That's understood. Thank you for letting that know. Well, I think we bring it forward forth earlier than later, uh, because we've heard quite loud and clear that the the main opposition to the speedway operation is the sound, and we have no tools to control that. It's important that the community understand. That we hear them loud and clear, and uh, no pun intended. And uh, we we're going to see what we can do to uh, to be able to mitigate sound. Thank you. Thanks, Director Grieve. All right, I'll uh, ask for a vote on that motion. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. We have a motion to move in camera. Moved, and I can second, and that's. Under 91K of the community charter. All in favor? 